Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Tuesday, September 17th, City of Sioux Falls Council meeting. Thanks for being here. Those of you in person, those of you who are joining us uh, online or on TV, welcome to you as well. Clerk, we'll go ahead and get started by reading our roll, please. Council members Brecky. Here. Erickson. Here. Kylie. Here. Neitzert. Here. Selberg. Here. Sale. Here. Starr. Here. Staley. Here. All right, here to give our invocation tonight, uh, our return visitor is Reverend Brett Best with uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church. So I would ask that you stand for our invocation and stay standing for our ple Pledge of Allegiance immediately after. Join me in an attitude of prayer. Our Father, we find ourselves here less than a week after the time of extraordinary winds and waters. These events provoked emotions from relief to grief and all points in between. It is belief, however, that causes us to pause and be thankful that human life was spared. We are also thankful for all the demonstrations of neighborliness and love that we have seen since that time. Our concern is for all who have suffered loss for those still taking a stand against risen waterways, and for everyone displaced by the tornadoes and floods. We are humbled by these powerful reminders that we are not just a community, not just a region, but an interwoven human family that shares this space of nature. Moving forward, let us renew our commitment to share this space you have given us with a deep desire to continue to do good to our neighbors. Thank you for this body of men and women whose purpose it is tonight to lead us forward. May they be endowed with wisdom as you give bountifully to all who ask. This is my offering in prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Broke it. I think this would. You know, I'd like to pause here uh, to highlight that this is POW MIA uh, Recognition Week. Uh, in light of this, I encourage everyone to take a few moments to reflect on the sacrifices made by American POWs and those missing in action. More importantly, this week is meant to remind us that we cannot give up our efforts to account for all of them. There remains approximately 82,000 unaccounted service members from conflicts as far back as World War II, over 350 of which, consequently, are from South Dakota. Sioux Falls included in that number. So POW MIA Recognition Week culminates with National POW MIA Recognition Day this Friday. And to this end, I'd invite you to Veterans Memorial Park this Friday at 6.30 for our POW MIA observance. So. Thanks for that point of privilege. As you can see, we have a, a flag here to honor those uh, still missing in action as well. So with that, we will move on tonight to our uh, agenda, starting with item four, which is our consent agenda, and look for any changes or motions to that. Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Selberg. All right, motion to approve by Erickson and seconded by Selberg. Any discussion, Council? Mr. Mayor. I'd like to, uh, in the September 13th uh, memorandum to the council, pull the item, uh, there's one item, I guess, as a uh, change order, the public parking and highway and streets item, item number one. All right. Any other changes, council? All right. We'll take a vote on that, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. 
We will move on to uh, item 37, which is our regular agenda. And I'll uh, look for a motion on that. Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Kylie. All right, motion to approve by Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Uh, are there any discussion on that, Councillor Erickson? I'll make a motion to amend moving items 49, 47, respectively, to follow immediately following item 41. All right, is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Seconded by Selberg. Um, all Mr. right. Mayor, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to would... take a vote on that one first, okay. if that's all right. Let's take a vote on that change, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Heitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Councillor Staley? And I'd like to make a motion to move item 50 immediately following item 40. All right, a motion to move 50 immediately following 40. Is there a second for that? Second. Starr? Okay, seconded by Councillor Starr. All right, we should take a vote on that, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? No. Selberg? No. Sale? No. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that fails five to three, so we're on to the amended main motion as it currently stands. Are there other changes or discussion? All right, we'll take a vote then, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Okay, that passes 8 to 0. Uh, we're at our general public input portion of tonight's agenda. Uh, and as a reminder, input during this portion will last no more than 3 minutes per person, and in total lasts no more than 30 minutes. Uh, during general public input, the public is welcome to speak on any topic that does not appear later on in the agenda. You can come up. I know you're ready. <laughs> For, for regular agenda items following general public input, comments are limited to three minutes unless the item is being presented for final adoption, in which case public input is limited to five minutes. For all regular agenda items, comments are limited to the agenda item under consideration only. And at this time, we'll begin public input. Clerk, please note our time is 7.07. I saw you popping up, so you were ready to go. Welcome. Uh, Greens Council, uh, request to have the overhead projector thrown on. You bet. We'll flip it on here. I'm Brian Burge representing the leadership team at Diamond Mowers. Uh, here to request uh, some ditch maintenance to be done. We have approximately 30 cubic yards of material that is silted in over the years that needs to be removed with approximately 160 square yards of reseeding to be done after it. Uh, this is 60th Street North, right next to the railroad levy. Uh, there's approximately three spots, approximately 50 feet long, that are the parts inflecting approximately eight inches of water. Additionally, the discharge of this also needs to be um, mowed and maintained. So looking from the from south, looking north, parallel to the railroad grade, there's approximately 1,200 linear feet of ditch that has overgrown throughout the years. Um, with two foot head pressure, there's only about 30 GPM of water get, trickling through there. So it's just a whole bunch of reeds and debris that is holding it up. The ramifications of these two backups is we have not only our parking lot flooded by approximately a foot of water, but the local neighbor to us, uh, Gilhausen and Floor, uh, Furniture Mart, which we've flooded their parking lot by pumping this water out of the ditch. And with that, uh, we'll reserve some time, but also willing to discuss um, resources necessary. Um, the other nice feature of this, there's currently an 8-inch uh, trash pump that's being used to evacuate this water. If that mowing is done, that resource could likely be freed up and redeployed throughout the city. Brian, have you talked to anyone in our city department on that? Anyone at the city of Sioux Falls? Okay, that'd be the best first route next time for something like this. And Lance Weatherly is actually here and he'll speak to you on that. Come forward, please. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Del Inca Baldwin, and I'm reading this statement on behalf of myself and my husband, Julian Baldwin. In recent years, the city of Sioux Falls has had to deal with a number of complaints of racism, whether it be in the form of the recent KKK flyers passed through the communities, swastikas popping up as graffiti or burned in the ground, or unite the white flyers being posted on our college campuses. The time to step forward and to be vocal is now, 
The citizens of Sioux Falls are known to come together when facing adversity. We unite to help out our brothers and sisters in their time of need. Today, I encourage each of you to call out racism when you see it. This is an action that takes courage, and our city has shown that we have courage uh, time and time again. I encourage our Human Relations Commission and our City Council to denounce the hate that we are seeing. I encourage our mayor to lead the initiative by issuing a public statement saying that we do not tolerate this behavior in our community. Oftentimes, silence can be seen as acceptance. If there is one thing we know about Sioux Falls, it is that we do not accept hate in any form. Now is the time to unite and drive any fear-based tactics, tactics used in this city. It is our moral obligation to ensure that hate is not tolerated in our community, to ensure that we stand on the side of love and fight against the evils of racism, to ensure that we make it known that hate has no home here. We will no longer be silent and we will no longer treat these issues of hate as if they are jokes. Fear will not control the citizens in our community and we stand together in unity to fight against hate and we ask that you stand with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is Jake. I live in the McKinnon Park neighborhood. Uh, so last Wednesday... What's when your last name, Jake? Members, what's that? What's your last name? I'm sorry. Bowman. Jake, All right. um, so last Wednesday, when a lot of members of the community were out helping clean up the city uh, from all the tornadoes that touched down, there was at least one individual in Sioux Falls who was passing out the Save Our Land, Join the Clan KKK pamphlets um, included with lollipops in them hmm. in the Cannon Park neighborhood. Um, there were multiple instances of this from people. Um, some people had them dropped on their porch, some of them in their front lawns, some of them in their little mini libraries. Um, you know, I saw a post about it on Facebook as well. A lot of people were talking about how it was fake news, some sort of a false flag operation, something like that. But um, I just felt it was important to bring it out, you know, and if any of you want to take a look at this and feel it, touch it, realize that it's real, that this is happening in Sioux Falls. There are people out there um, distributing this type of information. Um, one of the things that scares me is just kind of looking back to last August in El Paso, Texas, where they say it's one of the safest cities in the United States. There was 22 people that were killed and murdered, and the person that killed those people had a manifesto that used some of the same language that's included in this packet here. And one of the things that I remember hearing from a lot of people is uh, in that community was them saying how they never could have imagined something like this could happen in their community. And I don't want one day for somebody in Sioux Falls to show up on the national news saying they never thought something like this would happen in our community here. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention that, you know, this stuff is happening in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's being out there, it's being passed around. Um, I know some people contacted the police department and they said there wasn't a whole lot they could do. And I understand there's a fine line between the First Amendment free speech and what they're willing to do. Um, but I also know that there's other methods that um, could be done. I know there's some people that have uh, photographs of the guy that was handing this stuff out. So if the police department's able to identify and figure out who this guy is, you know, whether there, I know there's other tactics that they can employ with other uh, members, like if somebody's parking 14 feet, 11 inches in front of a fire hydrant where the law says you have to park 15 feet, get out the tape measure, measure it out, make this guy's life, like, let him know that he's, you know, hate isn't wanted in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and that's not who we are. So I don't know if you all want to pass it around or look at it. You, you sure can. You can give it to Councilor Brecky there in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Clara Jacob, and I live in McKinnon Park neighborhood also. Um, I've lived in Sioux Falls for 30 years, and I got one of these on my porch as well. Um, um, I'd be happy to send any of you copies of it if you don't want to take the time to look at it. But um, I'll make this really quick. Uh, this says, uh, join the Klan, and there's all sorts of language in the inside about why you should join the Klan. And um, I don't know if it's really outreach. <laughs> In my case, my father is a Holocaust survivor, so what some people might see as outreach, I see as intimidation. So I would ask that the city council step up and I don't know what you can do, maybe work with the police department, start a task force, do something to stop this. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Good evening. 
All right, good evening, everyone. Dave Fleetchuk from Avera. So I just wanted to stop and say thank you to our city partners here. Uh, in a time of devastation, there you can find gratitude if you look for it. And I'd say first and foremost that we had no loss of life was uh, pretty amazing if you see the devastation. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact it happened at night. If it happened during the day, we would have had another 500 people on campus, which could have been even more dangerous. Uh, grateful for our staff. They performed amazingly. They had 10 minutes with the notice from the phone to get uh, 102 people to safety on five different levels, and they did it in 10 minutes. It's really amazing. And so there's just a lot to be grateful. Our community partners, businesses, they've been giving free meals to our staff. They've been uh, helping a food truck on site, so I'm grateful uh, for that as well. Uh, we also had a patient who lived in a car. Uh, and his car was destroyed. So I said, we need to get his home fixed. So we took it to uh, Sioux Falls Auto Glass. And believe it or not, they saw the Avera badges and they said, what's going on? Well, Sioux Falls Auto Glass said, we'll take care of it. So it's a community helping community. We should all be proud of that. I also want to thank the state. By 4 a.m., we needed another place to house our patients. The state of South Dakota, so state of South Dakota came through and said, hey, the Human Service Center would be great. So uh, we were able to do that. The mayor and I were talking at four, uh, five in the morning. Uh, what can we do to help? What can the city do to help? It was just amazing. Uh, before that, though, I want to thank the uh, first responders, uh, specifically a person by the name of uh, Jason Leach with the Sioux Falls PD. He lives out by the Behavioral Health Hospital. He was in the command center uh, that night. The city actually gave us a bus and a passenger van that I never could have pulled off at 2 a.m. in the morning. So again, the city partners came through uh, for us. So I do want uh, to thank the city. We are grateful, we'll put our stuff together. Uh, I'm gonna have Tom Otten give you a little update on where everything is at because behavioral health is a sensitive issue in the community. Uh, and we just want you to know that. Also from uh, the state, city, county, a lot of folks have helped us. Uh, same time, our employees are proud. They want to help as well. So as much as the city can give us, really our employees want to also give back. And so they've been given friends and neighbors, taking care of friends and neighbors. That's really what this community is about. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, I thank you and your staff uh, for everything you've given us. Thank, thank you, Dave. Good evening. Thomas Otten, I'm the Assistant Vice President of Air Behavioral Health. Uh, I'll talk very briefly, uh, and Dave gave uh, a great overview of kind of what happened that night. We had 102 patients in the Behavioral Health Hospital that all had to be relocated uh, over the course of a very short period of time. Uh, I, too, would say it's been an amazing uh, story of partnership. The state of South Dakota partnered with us uh, within a few hours uh, to create uh, a new hospital unit down at the Human Services Center, three vacant units that they had. Uh, we had patients uh, in. Uh, before 24 hours had elapsed, and we've uh, created a space uh, at our uh, Prince of Peace campus for another 10 uh, adult patients. We're working with our PEDS department at the main campus to put our younger kids. Uh, we have two units of adults down at Human Service Center, uh, a unit of adolescents at the Human Services Center. Obviously, uh, this city and this state uh, would be uh, would collapse without uh, the beds that are uh, needed for psychiatric care in our community. Obviously, uh, getting all of those beds up and running has been very, very uh, important for us. We could not have done it without uh, collaboration of a whole lot of people. Uh, we're hoping to have our first unit back. Adult B uh, would be back uh, hopefully by this Friday. That was the unit that was least affected. Uh, within a month or so, we might have an additional couple units, uh, and then the two units that took the uh, tornado directly. It'll be several months before we will get those back. I do want people to know uh, the same way to access services uh, that you did before will be the same way you can do that now. Our assessment program is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, does free mental health assessments, 322-4065 or our 800 number of 1-800-691-4336. Uh, same would be true of Sioux Falls law enforcement. Uh, contact those numbers uh, with any hold patients, and we will make sure that we get their needs met as well. Our clinics uh, at the hospital uh, both opened on Monday. Uh, North Central Heart uh, opened on Monday. Our Sports Dome opened on Monday, all of which uh, took pretty uh, significant damage. So we are very pleased to have that all back uh, in place. I will echo Dave's comments uh, about the amazing uh, work of first responders uh, that evening. I was on site 
uh, within about 30 minutes of the tornado hitting. It was uh, an absolute amazement to watch uh, the first responders, everything that they did. Uh, thank you to the mayor uh, and everything that he did. Uh, thank you to our city. It has been, uh, if you look around you, it's amazing what has happened. Uh, I would also then just close with a thank you to our staff. I brought a prop with me tonight. Uh, this is a clock that was found in the rubble that was uh, our adolescent program. I brought it because it reminds me of the exact moment that our God put his hand of protection on our patients and our staff. Uh, it was uh, an exact, uh, an amazing moment for our staff to get 102 patients to safety, and I'm uh, so appreciative that they did that. Thank wow. you for your time. Thank you, Thomas. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Reverend Dr. Naomi Ludeman Smith, and I'm an employee of Avera, and I was on call at the Heart Hospital that night. And I also want to express my gratitude for the way that the city stepped in. I'm also here tonight as chair of, the, of South Dakota Voices for Peace. There are a number of people in this room. I don't know if it's proper to allow people to stand to say, we're here because we're concerned about the racism that's taking place in Sioux Falls. I moved here from Aberdeen in May. I'm concerned about action, voices from the city leadership to counter what's taking place here. I'm the daughter of a city council member in Richfield, Minnesota, 20 years on the council. I saw the impact that the leadership makes in the culture of a city. We'd love to see a resolution from the city council against the hate acts that are taking place in this city. We'd like to see a task force that's put together that addresses these increasing incidents in this city that I now call home. Thank you, Naomi. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening, council members. Mr. Mayor, my name is Taniza Islam. I'm the Executive Director of South Dakota Voices for Peace. Today we've heard statements from members of our Jewish, Christian, Muslim, young, old residents of Sioux Falls. Hate symbols such as swastikas, the letters KKK, hooded Klansmen, and bias-motivated statements are traumatic to see and hear. It's crucial that leaders assure impacted communities that they heal and are listened to and move away from making excuses on why these things are happening, like they're just a prank or kids who didn't know what they were doing. I'd like to also mention systemic bias in our communities, which have severe negative impact. One example I'd like to offer is effective May 1st, 2019, the county commission agreed to cut 90% of court interpreter funding. This impacts residents of Sioux Falls who are English language learners severely. This is a blank check that was handed to bias motivated landlords, corrupt business people, and abusive English proficient spouses and partners because now victims with limited English proficiency are on the hook to pay for their own interpreter to tell their story in court. This has a direct impact on our city and makes us unsafe. What can the city do? I'm gonna offer some suggestions. Perhaps loan Minnehaha County $20,000, because that's what they said that they're saving, and provide safer environments for Sioux Falls residents and provide access to justice. Language access to city services is a dire issue. Without language access, there is no access. This is the first step. Marketing city services in the top five languages identified by the Sioux Falls Public School District seems like a first step. Perhaps hiring bilingual staff people at the counters that are most trafficked could be a logical step. We also need to restart programs like Compassionate Sioux Falls, which brings communities together to learn from each other. And we need to, we need to do better for our voiceless communities. And the city needs to take a stronger approach at least start with a resolution in ensuring that the culture of our city is in fact inclusive. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Jim Stanga. The only thing I find in my front yard is needles. 
needles. So kids can walk by and pick them up, and they can stick them with themselves, and then they can give them to their friends, and they can stick them with them. I'm tired of finding needles in my front yard, but that isn't what I came to talk about. What I came to talk about is I went up to Pier for nine to ten years, lobbying for children's rights. I saw how corrupt Pier was. You don't have to go very far for corruptness, but you can also just watch the city council meetings every week on corruptness. When it came down to Bruce coming up with his petition, it was stated that there's nothing wrong with this city, nothing wrong in how it's being run. You know, this city could run a heck of a lot better without a city council. It would save the citizens $200,000 a year, and we all know the Americans say yes. But we do know one thing. Either it's going to be open and honest, or it's going to be run corruptly. So we can make a decision. I've asked Bruce, maybe he should broaden his petition and state, let's get rid of the city council. Let's go with a straight mayor. Let's find out what truth, what it really is on open and honestness. And let's find out if we're going to be open and honest or corrupt. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Barry Zacharias, and I've been an immigrant in this community for the last uh, 30 years. Proud to call this city my home. I have a wife with four kids and three grandkids. At the age of 25, I don't know how that happened. But I do want to make a couple of comments. Uh, it's, it's disheartening to hear what some have called an insidious uh, racism. Uh, and I believe that uh, we all, we as immigrants ourselves, sometimes can contribute to that aspect of it. If we would only integrate with the mainstream of society and in some ways educate the local people about our cultures, be willing to risk and take that step forward, I think the, the onus of responsibility lies on me to make sure that I open up and educate people when I come in. That's my first thing. Mr. Mayor, I do also want to say, and I, I wonder if we could break with protocol and give our city uh, workers a round of applause for the extraordinary manner in which they responded to the recent uh, uh, crisis that took place. And at the helm of the crisis was our, our mayor, not directing people to go here, go there, but by example, inviting people to come forward and participate with him in cleaning up the mess that was left behind. He did it in March. He did it again, down dirty and grungy. It was good to see you that way. Uh, inviting people to come forward and partner with him because if you call this your city, and it is your city, I'm a transplant, and you are natives of the city, and if this is your city, then it's the onus again of responsibility is what can I do to participate? Thank you for what you did, both in March and now. You led by example, and that's why people going up and down 33rd, to 41st Street and Western Avenue, that's where I live, called out to me and said, your house is next. And an hour later, went across and picked up garbage or debris from my neighbor's house when he wasn't there. That, is, that comes from leadership by example. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to thank you for that, and God bless you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Council. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to speak today in regards to the concept of a, a, a chief uh, cultural officer. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to speak about as we talk about all of the things that we're going to discuss for today is, is that idea. There are many cities and organizations that focus on uh, industry. There are many organizations that focus on infrastructure. 
I am uh, excited about the idea of having a city that is focused on people. People do and make things for people. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is a general way that we typically have conversations about these type of things. Well, we don't need it. You know, people are not, are not quitting. And, and the reason why that kind of jumped out at me is because that's one dangerous way to get feedback, right, is people quitting. Um, we have people who are doing very difficult jobs that are doing tough work. Um, first of all, we're talking about people who are generally boomers, Midwestern boomers, so they don't quit, number one. But number two is to say that even in their roles, wherever it is that they're at, is it optimal? Are they happy? Are they healthy? Are they focused? Are they engaged? Those are the type of things that we can do with positions that take this level of focus. And as somebody who spent uh, the better part of the last decade spending the majority of their brain power at such uh, uh, topics, I can tell you that there's a very special focus and skill set that has to go into something like this. Because the person that pulls me over, the person that puts out the fires, the person who cleans my water, I don't just want them compensated. I want them happy. I want them focused. I want them empowered. I want them supported. I want them engaged. That's an important uh, uh, concept. Outside of that, the other thing that I wanted to discuss is the hope that this can go beyond that and that we can deal with the leaders in our community, our titans of business, our mental health folks, as we find ways to improve our culture for our community, both in how we engage and interact with each other, but how we work, um, what we can do with each other. First of all, there's no greater cost driver. Recent studies have shown that we suffer in, in physical, mental, and emotional health. And the opportunity to improve that is there's nothing, no single item that would save us more money than that. Again, people do and make things for people. I would just ask that we think about these type of opportunities, that we have a position to change and not lag, but be out in front of these type of conversations, conversations and the things that we can do in communities. Now, there is no playbook for new. And there are things that we have to do and we have to figure out, but for me, that's not a burden, that's an opportunity. That's a chance for us to customize things for our city, for our community, um, for those that we care about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My name's Jen Dreisky. Keep, keep going. Okay, and I'm the vice president of Mount Zion Congregations, the synagogue here in town. I'm a Jewish mother of a five-year-old Jewish little boy as his mother, my job and most important responsibility is to keep my son safe, create an environment where he is loved, included, and celebrated like all children deserve. When the swastika was burned into the ground at Tut Hill Park near my house, my heart froze. Not only do I like to believe things like anti-Semitism doesn't happen here. I was coldly reminded that it does. Whether intentional. With the growing rise of anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world, we need security at our own synagogue here in town to keep people, my people, safe. I ask each of you to make a statement and take action that would make Jacob and all of our children and our grandchildren proud. Be the leaders now that so many leaders from our histories failed to be. I ask all of you to be braver and channel all the courage to help us create a community that is stronger than hate. Hate has no home in South Dakota and especially in Sioux Falls. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, this will be our last public input for general public input. Sierra Bruce at Sioux Falls. You know what gets me is, I've been here for, what, five years? I've been saying about racism all the time, and we got people that are running for office, and all of a sudden, they want to jump by and say racism, and let's change the community, but not Tanisha, Julian's wife. Where were they at fighting crime, high crime neighborhoods, getting the police to do their job, making arrests on, on, on stuff that needs to be done out here, fighting for body cameras that need to be on the police officers. And we could go on and on and on about racism here. Julian knows very well, because I'm from Louisiana and I'm a true Cajun. Julian is not a true Cajun. He understands the history of Louisiana with the KKK is here. It was a swastika. No action was taken. It's not against the law. Now let me tell you this, why is it not against the law? 
we have David Saylor. That I said we were going to protest because I believe in protesting and I believe in violence on the streets when needed be. Just like the Trayvon Martin case. We need to put our foot down and take action on the streets with the African Americans. Instead of always going to jail because they're beating up their wives or drug dealing or this or the other. The African Americans need to come together and fight for what's going on in the world of Sioux Falls on their racism. I'm half African American, and in African American culture here, I'm embarrassed of what the African Americans are doing, cluttering the court system with all of this criminal activity here. David Saylor went down the street on September the 1st and yelled the N-word and was making racial slurs to everybody. And we had a sergeant tell me on a recorded line, uh, Tanisha should know this, the law, he said that it was freedom of speech, that there's no law in South Dakota to hold Mr. David Saylor liable. But he does have warrants for his arrest. We will pick him up on those warrants. As of today, Mr. Saylor still has three warrants. So the African Americans need to come together because I said to the parent of the victim that I was going to get CNN, John Freeman, and I was going to flood the streets here from other states, if we need be, to take action on this. Because we're going to sit here and talk and talk about racism till we're blue in the face. Until people hit these streets and flood the streets to African Americans and protest. If it ends up in a riot, it ends up in a riot. We have to make it be known. you got to put your foot down on this in a better way. Some people might not agree with me, but I was in the Trayvon Martin case. And look where it got, look where it got that city with the police department. So instead of sitting here preaching and complaining about it, take action and put those people out on the streets and start protesting like you're supposed to be doing. Thank you. All right, Clerk, we'll move on. To Mr. Our Mayor, question, please. Councilor Starr. I would move to suspend the rules and allow additional time for public input. There are a lot of people, we were pretty loose with uh, some people to uh, allow them to speak on agenda items. Uh, the ordinance does not allow for that, actually. Councilor Starr, so we're going to move on to the next item, please. The next item is a notice of change orders. Public parking, highways, streets, project descriptions, village on the river, public works, utilities modifications, the vendors, journey group companies, DBA, journey construction, and the amount of $121,381. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. The change order that's on the consent agenda tonight we took advantage of um, the time that the roads were going to be closed uh, near the village on the river parking ramp project. We upgraded the water main on River Road. Um, the alley that's between the parking ramp and the backside of the new um, Sanford Clinic in Lewis, that's called Mall Avenue. That sanitary sewer example was um, cobblestone, made out of cobblestone, very old, and so we took the opportunity to upgrade that. Essentially, this change order is uh, additional work that about 10% additional work when we were out there that we may have had to go further on a water main to make a connection. Um, we, had, uh, we had light upgrades, we had streetscape upgrades, we had storm drainage upgrades. So it's essentially um, additional utility work that encapsulated it in River Road in 10th Street um, as we took advantage of the roads that were closed. So when the new hotel at 9th and Phillips opens, we won't be out there disrupting that as we upgraded the water main, uh, things of that nature. So uh, with that, we would ask for your support. All right. Councilor Starr, you pulled this. Do you have uh, questions for Mark? No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. And this is uh, just a notice, so there's not a vote on this item, so we'll move on to our next item. Next item is item 39. Special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Stockyards Plaza Incorporated to be operated at 301 East Falls Park Tri for a social on September 24, 2019. Item 40, special one-day malt beverage license for St. Michael's Catholic Church Parish, 1600 South Marion Road for a fundraiser on September 28, 2019. Stacy, you're going to speak to these tonight? Yeah, thank you. Jamie Palmer's on vacation. Uh, these are both uh, standard one-day malt beverage licenses uh, from parties that have had these in the past, uh, item 39, is, uh, they've done it on multiple occasions, and uh, this is the second year in a row for item 40. All right. Anyone from the public here to speak on these items tonight? Councilors, do you have any questions for Stacy on either of these? 
Moved to approve Erickson. Second sale. All right, motion approved by Erickson, seconded by sale. Uh, any discussion? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We will move on to our next item. Item 41, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations for bike trail development, <coughs> parks and recreation, $200,000. Councilor Neitzer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This reading tonight is to talk about a supplemental appropriation to fund an extension of the bike trail. The funding stores would be from the 2018 capital surplus. There's currently $474,000 remaining in that surplus. The request would be to appropriate $200,000 of the capital surplus and add that to the park and recreation budget. It would require no cuts to current projects, but in the last week, things have changed, and, and what changed was the tornado. Um, so because of that, we need to make a little bit of an adjustment. Um, and I, I apologize for the late notice, but this is something that we've been watching day after day. I've been in communication with the administration, and as of yesterday, there are some capital losses. Um, we don't know exactly what that amount is going to be yet. They're going to start surveying. I think they may even have started in the lab, you know, today. Um, and we'll find out what that is. Um, there's going to be sidewalk, curb, gutter, street light, traffic signal repairs. Uh, again, we don't know exactly what it is. Um, the amount needed for the capital surplus, if any, is going to be known in the coming weeks. And right now, we just, we just don't know. Storm recovery obviously takes priority over bike trail funding, so I'm going to request to defer the supplemental appropriation for design of the bike trail for 60 days. Uh, finance and public works feel like that should be an adequate amount of time to get the cost estimates and, and get the bids out and, and do all of that work. Um, this is really a pause. We need to get past the unknown so then we can move forward, and this is really out of an abundance of caution, and I believe it's in the best interest of the city to do this. Now, I want to make clear the timeline is not changing that I'm proposing as far as the bike trail. I'd still propose construction in 2021, and we'll get to that budget amendment. Proposing design and engineering in 2020. Uh, the 2018 supplemental funding may still be available in, si in 60 days. If not, there's a lot of other options I've already talked to about finance. I've talked to with finance that includes things like there's likely to be a budget surplus of capital dollars from the 2019 budget year. Uh, FEMA reimbursements we have coming back from the flooding in the spring, and then there's some other things as well. Uh, so working with the administration to make sure funding is secured, and I'm confident it's going to get funded. And with that, I am going to request to defer this item until the third regularly scheduled meeting in November. All right, thank you, Councilor Neitzer. Appreciate the uh, awareness of the situation and... and uh, Offering to do that, I'm going to ask if there's anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight. Good evening. Greetings. I'm David Sokaitis, and I had uh, some good words for Councillor and the City Council on this particular topic. Maybe it should wait for two months, but it's ready to go, so we'll just keep on trucking. On the bike trail expansion, where do I point this anymore? Okay. Great idea. I'm fond of the bike trail. I, I think most of you know that by now. Talked about it enough. Health, nature, beauty. I, I've read science articles that say that we are all healthier if we get out exercise some more, and we are also healthier if we experience nature and green things. Nature shows benefit, or science shows benefits for people using the bike trail. It also makes the city more attractive. And when the city is more attractive to, say, the up and coming, you know, the, the millennials, then that encourages workforce development. All valuable goals. I would kind of like to recommend to the uh, bike trail people that when they develop new bike trails, that they use these structures called box, box culverts. That way you don't have to go over the road, you can go underneath it and zip on by. And it's safer for everybody and a lot more convenient. Oops. I haven't done this for so long, I forgot I'd do it. And I also kind of recommend that we uh, consider elevation and flooding so, so that the bike trail is more useful during more of the year. Typically in the spring, there's low spots and they get flooded, and then you can't use the bike trail. So 
something to consider. And of course, we should all try to enjoy our, our life in the city. And here, this is kind of unrelated, but it shows people having a good time. And with that, good evening, everybody. All right. Thank you, David. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? All right, counselors, look for... Oh, come forward, sir. No problem. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Jason Muller. I'm a pastor here in town, and uh, I am on the bicycle committee as well as... Uh, I want to always advocate for the working poor. The bicycle trail has become a hub for a lot of our working poor to get around. You know, they, they pay taxes in the jobs they have, but they don't have a lot of transportation. So I'm really excited about uh, Councilman uh, Neitzert's desire to increase the bicycle trail. It's only going to improve our city. Um, there's a lot of information coming out that every dollar we invest in bicycling and pedestrian traffic will come back to us uh, two and three times, uh, two and three times fold. Uh, North Carolina just had a huge study on the money they invested into their bicycle trail system and every opportunity they've had, they see business investment coming back, dollars coming back into the community because of what they've created. You know, I like to remember that Rick Noby did an incredible job with him and the other men that actually set up the Greenway, but I don't think they ever realized how important the bicycle trail is going to be to this community. The number of people that are traveling on it, whether they're walking, using a bicycle, or even for those who are actually need to be able to uh, ride their electric chairs because of their own disabilities. And so there's incredible things going on. And I just want to really encourage the council to uh, see to uh, Councilman Neitzert's uh, proposal and to follow through on this because I know I, I'm really appreciative, uh, Greg, that you had talked about the concerns for our our city and the expenses that have to be paid for first. Very important. But again, this investment down the road will only come back to us two and three fold as we continue to grow our bicycle trail, creating a safer place for people to walk and to bicycle. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jason. Good evening. <clears throat> Dwayne Skipper. Uh, I'll just follow up on that last comment about a safer place to walk. It's been at least 25 years since I've been on the bike trail between Minnesota Avenue and Cliff. I got so close to being rammed by a bike that I can only remember that I would have been probably seriously injured by it. So it is a bike trail, it's not a walking trail. The other thing is, is the $200,000 that we're talking about, if the people in this city knew that they were paying three times more for water and sewer, maybe that money should be invested in that critical infrastructure that everybody has to pay for. And the other thing I'll say about bike trails is that I've seen these painted bike images on blacktop on certain streets, and I'm wondering, what in the world does that do to anybody? Apparently, some federal money or something came in, and we decided to put the paint on the streets. I don't know where that bike symbol goes or what it does. The other thing is, is when we're building streets, we're adding six to eight feet of concrete onto the street so that the bike person can beyond that piece of concrete. Is this about the bike trail, Dwayne? Can you keep it about the bike trail system? Do you I'm have any other comments about the bike on the, trail. No, you're talking about street development. Do you have any other comments on the bike trail? If not, thank you for your I've comment. I've got three minutes left. Please talk about the bike trail then. Okay. The bike trail money does not need to be spent, period. Like I said, I've not been on it for that very reason. We've got other places to spend money. So that's my opinion on it. It's not a safe place. In fact, I heard people from the city say that they have injuries like one or, you know, several during the week of people getting hurt on that bike trail. So let's either make it a complete bike trail that nobody else can use and maybe charge a fee for it because I don't get any use out of it, quite honestly. Thanks. All right. Anyone else here to speak on this topic tonight? 
All right, I'd maybe look for a motion. Councilor Knight, so do you want to make a motion on this and then move to discussion? Sure. I, I'm going to make a motion to defer this item to the third regularly scheduled meeting in November. Second, Erickson. All right. Uh, discussion. Councilor Knight, so just very, very shortly, again, I. I Again, I just want to apologize to those who came for this, but uh, stay tuned in the, uh, we're gonna, in the budget hearing, we're going to have a discussion about the bike trail to uh, put the construction piece in there. And I'm confident in just a few months that we can get this thing funded and then we will still be designing in 2020, hopefully. But we just need to wait a little bit out of an abundance of caution. It's just a, a timing thing. So we're still going to talk about the master timeline in the budget, so don't go anywhere. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion on this one? All right, we'll take a vote on that motion to defer then. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. We'll move on to our next item. The next item is item 49, a resolution amending the 2019-2023 capital program to add funding to CIP project number 14002, bike trail development. Councilor Neitzer. For the same reasons, I'm going to make that motion to defer, but we can wait for public input. Sounds good. Uh, is there anyone from the public wishes to speak on this item? All right, Councilor Knights, I'll look for a motion from you on it. Motion to defer this item to the third regularly scheduled meeting in November. Second, Erickson. All right, motion by Knights, hurt, and seconded by Erickson to defer that to November. Any discussion, Council? All right, we'll take a vote on that one. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Okay, that passes 8 to 0. We'll move on to our next item. Next item is item number 47, a resolution adopting the budget for fiscal year ending December 31st, 2020 and the 2020-2024 capital program. Good evening. Good evening, Sean. Sean Pritchett, <clears throat> Finance Department. Um, hearkening back to earlier this year, uh, work began in earnest in January in the fiscal year 2020 budget that, and the five-year capital program that's being considered this evening. Seven months of drafting uh, and reviewing proposals and assessing priorities uh, have culminated with the submission of this year's budget and five-year capital program, um, with the capital program having been submitted to you in June and the budget, uh, proposed budget being submitted to you in July. I want to take an opportunity to thank the mayor and the mayor's staff for the many hours that were spent reviewing the budget and the capital proposals and establishing the priorities to recommend moving forward. The one Sioux Falls framework provided the vision and the mayor's push to increase engagement in the budget process across departments and with the general public providing an opportunity to increase the feedback that we received, as well as open opportunities to consider new and innovative initiatives. I also wanna take an opportunity to thank the directors and their staff who are highly involved and engaged throughout this budget process and very appreciative of their patience, openness, and receptiveness to the changes in the budget process that were rolled out this year. And finally, uh, and certainly not least, I want to thank the finance staff whose talents and experiences have been critical to the overall budget preparation process. It is a privilege to be able to stand before you and come forward and represent their hard work over the past many months. Finance staff's professionalism, energy, and skills have far exceeded any expectation that I had in coming to this position late last year. The recommended budget for fiscal year 2020 for the City of Sioux Falls is $545.8 million, which includes all applicable funds and enterprises for the city, as well as the first year of the capital investments included in the five-year capital program. The general fund portion of this budget totals $177.7 million. Also included in this resolution is adoption of the five-year capital program for the city, which totals $776.5 million. The capital program and budget is a plan, and it is responsible and respectful of the revenues the city receives, while also being responsive to the ongoing needs of the community. The budget prioritizes continued financial stability, similar to how it has been maintained over the last several years, and supports our ability to adapt and have situational awareness to the unforeseen events and changes in economic conditions that may materialize. Finally, the budget and capital program represent balance, continuing to preserve and maintain the quality of life of the amenities our residents have come to enjoy and expect. But most of all, based on the overwhelming, uh, 
overwhelming reaction that we've had in discussions with the community's residents who have expressed a high priority for our city over the next several years to reinvest in the basics and in the core infrastructure. This budget and capital program from its very foundation and as it was conceived, first and foremost, seeked, sought to achieve this objective. I close by uh, also extending my uh, final thank you to you as city council members, as well as your staff, your budget analyst, David Bixler, as well as your operations, uh, operations manager, uh, Jim David, for the transparency in discussing your priorities and prospective amendments over the past several weeks and months. Uh, at, in going through this budget process. We have been very appreciative of the partnership we have had with you working through this year's capital program and budget. And with that, I'll stand by for any additional questions you might have in that regard. All right, thank you, Sean. So here's how we'll, we'll do public input. If, if you are here to speak on the overall city budget, uh, you can come forward at this time. But I know some of you are here to speak on specific amendments that amendments aren't noticed. So you may not know what amendments are coming forward. So if you're here to speak on one that you already know about, wait till we bring up that amendment and then you can come speak to that. If you're not aware of any amendments and you just want to give input on the budget, uh, you can do that as well. And so uh, at this point, we'll have uh, general public input on the overall budget. <coughs> Dwayne Skipper, Sioux Falls. Okay, you know what, I need to clarify one piece. Um, public input will not be allowed on the amendments, okay? So all public input on the budget, amendments included, will happen right now. So that's my mistake. So if you're here to speak on anything related to the budget tonight, uh, thank you for clarification, Councillor Staley, on that. Um, we'll take that right now. So my apologies, Mr. Skipper, the floor is yours again. Well, you'll have to stop me if I go get into the amendment process or something because I'm not prepared to think about amendments. Um, first of all, I just want to give you my view or understanding of what the term chief culture officer means. I saw some kind of a definition of it in the paper. My understanding is, is that it's uh, a position that is intended to help employees feel good about what they are doing in their job and to try to retain them. That's kind of my understanding of it. Uh, doesn't, you know, culture can mean a bunch of different things to different people. So with that, I will just say that I found in the budget that the total hires for the city has decreased from 178 in 2015 down to 154 in 2016, down to 136 in 2014, and now it's down to 133. So the idea of turnover, looking at the facts of what's happened in the past, doesn't seem to hold true. So that's just one item that I'd like the council to consider. Um, few more items in the budget. City Council Professional service Services, 187,000 up to 388,000 or 107% increase. Mayor of Professional Services, up 50,000. That's way over 4,000. There wasn't hardly anything in there last year. Here's one that kind of bothers me. Police staffing up from 296 in 2017 to 311. That's 15 new, I believe it's officers, in three years. It's kind of a sign of city growth and of times. And I will say one other thing about the police department. The only thing I have ever heard about a budget problem or what they get paid is the city police department. I have never heard any discussion about any other budget approval process for any departments in the city. But for some reason, over the, the last administration and this administration, when anything comes up about the police department wanting more money or whatever, there's an issue with it. And I don't understand it. 
Uh, street maintenance. We all know what street maintenance has been. It's been terrible. This budget has a street maintenance program item that's one-tenth of one percent negative. In other words, there is no money for street maintenance in this, uh, in this budget. Um, here's another one. Orpheum building improvements. $820,000 in the first three years of the capital program. I happen to know a lot about the Orpheum Theater from where I worked. Um, it's a great place if you want to go to the theater and whatever. It, it, it serves a certain number of people in the city. But at the time when I was dealing with it, the, the reason that it wasn't working is that it took too much money to keep the building up. And here we are again with the same situation. $820,000. And the other thing is, is that we've talked, or the, the council and the mayor have talked about, or the uh, transit department has talked about their capital program, transit system capital program, $6 million over the next five years. In that is a transit office remodel of $1,900,000. Now, the numbers that were presented by the transit was that their revenue is going down, they're trying to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, it looks like some numbers should be adjusted there. And finally, technology. Capital spending up 269%. So here's some ideas of where the money's going, and I'll say it again, we need to transfer money to the water and sewer department. Thank you. Good evening. Greetings. I'm David Sokaitis, and I have some ideas on the budget and, and other things, too. <laughs> the current budget process, well, you know, if you look at the city charter, there it is. And basically, it's the mayor's budget, and it gets introduced to the city council, and Three hearings, a couple of readings, approval, pretty much. I'd like to note that the budget is half a billion dollars. Really, half a billion dollars. I would think that that amount of money would take a whole lot of scrutiny in that and analysis. That, that's just a whole lot of money. So I'm thinking that maybe what should happen in the future is the mayor might like throw some ideas out not a complete budget, just some rough ideas out, like two months ahead of time, and then council can go and ring, ring it out and check it out, and a lot of public input. And, and then you get more, you get a better budget, I think, if you have more input and more analysis, because half a billion dollars deserves a whole lot of work. Now, um, Director Pritchett showed this last week in the general fund expenses, and I n took a look and noticed that police is... <clears throat> About a quarter of that. That's like $40 million. So I thought maybe um, if we were careful, we might be able to reduce that amount and increase safety at reduced cost. What an idea. But first you have to think about what's really going on in government, what's the purpose of law. And uh, I've been here before, and there's some presentations that I did and said, you know, law is not really all about public safety. It's got some other attributes, but uh, you can read about it on those presentations. Drug prohibition is a real problem in our society, and most people aren't even aware of what its <laughs> origin is and, and what it's for. But uh, it's all about racism in the early days and crushing democratic movements in Nixon days. And now it's all about protecting <laughs> the alcohol and pharmaceutical industries. Not good. We need to do some work on this. The drug policy that we have, I think it could use a whole lot of work, and I've talked about that repeatedly. I think if we had more treatment and less jail, we'd have less addiction problems. Homelessness is a driver of crime, so if we could build a low-budget, high-effectiveness shelter, I think we'd get a little less crime from that area. Homicides, they're no fun to talk about, but I watched a TED Talk recently and according to the speaker, most homicides are preventable if we care about troubled children. 
because they come out of messed up homes and they end up as messed up adults and they don't deal very well. I think also the police department in general could lighten up and if they would do that, they wouldn't need to waste so much manpower. You don't need four people, for example, to harass one innocent person who's shoveling <coughs> salt off the bike trail. Um, so there's uh, some related talks I've given in the past. Our culture believes in victimless crimes. It's kind of a bizarre concept. Used to be that if you had, if there were two white guys were kissing in the park, you'd hunt them down and put them in a jail. <coughs> and then after that, if you saw black guys protesting, you'd put them in jail. Well, now we punish people who use chemicals to change the way they feel, like marijuana. I don't see much value in doing that personally. I, if marijuana is safer than alcohol, what's the point? Oh, and these things, push bumpers, they're a hell hazard if you ever bump into anybody. So I think we could get rid of them, save some money. Police cars idle, burns up a lot of gas. I don't see the point. Now here is something that I haven't seen anywhere else. We design roads basically for 100 miles an hour. 41st Street, it's flat, it's straight. And then you <laughs> slap a speed limit on it, 35, and expect it to work. Well. If you want people to slow down, you could put some rolling hills into the road surface. And people would go the speed that you design the rolling hills for. Oh, and of course, we should try to enjoy nature and, and be good people, that kind of stuff. So good evening. Thank you. Anyone here to speak on specifics related to the city of Sioux Falls budget? Emphasis on the item under consideration, which is our budget. Okay, so um, Sierra Broussard Sioux Falls. So here we go with this. The chief um, cultural officer, I'm going to read you what an employee of 23 years says about this. Jennifer Holson, 23 hours. I have been retired from the city of Sioux Falls for 11 years. Prior to my retirement, I was the director of human resources for 23 years. Working for five different mayors under three different forms of government. Mayors are elected officials who come to city government mainly naive in their understanding of governmental, accounting, financing, and government, government issues. That does not diminish any managerial or leadership qualities. It just recognizes their lack of Bureaucrat, bureauc bureaucratic leadership, management, and cultural issues and personnel in city government itself. Mayor Tim Hankins' latest proposal to add a chief cultural officer that would work out of his office to address employee turnover in city government by fostering better employee, employee engagement and administering programs that cultivate the next generation of leaders at City Hall makes no sense. The city has a director of human resources and an extremely competent HR department who's responsible to address and plan for those very issues. The mayor is responsible for the overall administration of government operations. That's why he oversees his appointed of officials who are directly responsible for managing their departments and uh, functions. Employee retention and recruitment is the direct responsibility of the uh, human resources department, leadership development, cultural development, people development, and success planning is the responsibility of the director of human resources and department managers. That's what they are paid to do. How do I know that? Because I speak from experience. My department under my leadership monitored employee recruitment and retention with forecast, forecast, for, with forecasted retirement and turnover data. The directors were constantly informed of retention issues and were tasked along with our direction and leadership with putting together comprehensive training and leadership development action plans to deal with the so-called silver tsunami, which by the way is not some new phenomenon just discovered by Mayor Tinhaken. We identified it well over a decade ago. Myself and other elected, <coughs> selected directors <coughs> attended a national secession planning conference and came back to Sioux Falls ready to put plans in place to deal with the issue. As directors, we worked together to identify people within our organization who had either had been identified as 
having the potential and skills necessary to move into leadership and, manage, and manager positions, irrespect, irrespective of their home department. We totally revamped the recruitment, testing, and hiring practices for police and fire, where the silver, silver, silver tsunami was a clear and present danger. The city of Sioux Falls is a co coveted employer by people looking for a job. It offers an excellent wage and benefit package, including the pension system and private sector, no longer offers its employees. The turnover rate has always been historically low, ranging anywhere from a low of 2% to a high of 5%. This is what we in the field call a healthy turnover rate. Why? Because change is good, and with change comes new talent. The fact is the city of Sioux Falls don't have a recruitment and retention problem that other employees were faced with back then and don't have one now. That does not mean we ignored the silver, silver tsunami or that we ignored targeted areas where we, where we knew we needed to identify specific recruitment actions for certain technical or highly skilled positions that were outside our normal recruitment area. And then it goes on to more. So y'all should have got the email because I sent it to y'all. I know some council members are looking at me like I'm boring. But we're talking about money here. And we're talking about the middle class average people because now I'm, I'm upset because I'm seeing facial expressions. And some of these people here on city council are for the rich people. And it, ir it irritates me to know tomorrow how people can do this. And we're going to be spending money on bogusness when we had Colleen Moran in place to do this. Thank you. Right, who else here to speak on our city budget initiatives tonight? Good evening. Good evening, City Council, Mayor David Heinel, 205 South Menlo Avenue. I did, I actually sent you an email. Um, some of you have, may have read it. I, I walk, I bike, I ride the bus around this great city, and I've lived here over the past five years. And it brings me great joy to live where I live because it's, it's close to everything I can get around. I can see friends, I can do social atmosphere, I can go to work, and I can do everything that I want to do in my daily life. Um, with that being said, there, there's a great comfort in, in understanding that, and it brings me great passion to advocate for the rights of other individuals in this community that may choose to walk, bike, or ride the bus, um, so that they can have a safe route to get to their destination. Countless number of times I see people riding up and down 10th Street. And I've seen, over the past five years, I've seen the city invest tens of millions of dollars in constantly expanding roads on the fringe of our city. And it's all for a good cause because we have to grow and continue to maintain that. But we also have to make sure that we're investing in our city streets that are in our core area um, and making it safe for people that are out there today and making sure that they are included in the process of how we design our streets and how we build out our city um, and making sure that both transportation and land use issues are married together inextricably that we can include people in the process and become a more diverse city that's, that's equitable, that offers everything for, for them and gives them opportunity to, to be who they are and give them um, opportunities. Um, a lot of the stuff, we invest in things like double left turn lanes that a lot of cities across the country, it's not necessarily needed. We are literally allowing people to save extra time when we can reduce the size of the street we can calm traffic, we can slow cars down. It's not a bad thing. Um, we can keep cars moving, but we can also slow them down so it's more walkable. It's an atmosphere that's more pleasant for people to be out, whether they're riding the bus or waiting for the bus or um, being out there. And that's adding street trees to those major arterial streets um, and not building them to be so wide because we're just building more lanes, we're adding more cars to the road, we're making it a dangerous atmosphere for everybody. Um, there are opportunities where we can design roads to be safe, um, but I just wanted to make sure that those issues are put forth with the decisions that you're making because 
20% of the next five years is going towards streets and infrastructure, that's a pretty large, that's $100 million. On the flip side, you've got $45 million going towards parks and open space. In a city where I live in a neighborhood where it's difficult to get to a park. We have to travel outside of the neighborhood in Pettigrew Heights to get to open space. And you can incorporate that, thing, that stuff into the design of our streets. 10th, 11th Street, Prairie Avenue, 9th Street, 12th Street. Incorporate things like traffic circles and doing bump outs in the neighborhood. Incorporating signage that allows drivers to just giving them the visual cue um, through just painting lines. I live pretty close to the 10th Street curve um, and it's become aware to me that high friction surface treatment is being put down on the roads and it's being put down as we speak. Um, it helps in some cases, it helps on in the interstate, but what I'm trying to say is that these are city streets, they're not highways, and we need to design them accordingly. We need to get rid of the idea of level of service because that's a big driver of this budget and the streets that we design um, and that makes them dangerous for everyone. And we're not being inclusive and we're not being equitable for everyone that may not have access to a car. I myself gave up that opportunity last year and I'm happy for it because it gives me great pleasure to enjoy riding around this beautiful city. Um, and I want the same thing for everyone else in the community. And that is, um, it's a powerful thing because there's nothing more simple than just seeing people riding bikes, people walking, and just getting to enjoy their community because they're meeting their neighbors and they're enjoying everything that the city has to offer. And I, basically that's, that's kind of all. And I just hope that you make the right decision and that you know that you're positively impacting people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anyone else here to speak tonight on our budget? Good evening. Greetings. Jason Muller again. I'm a pastor, and I also live in Pettigrew Heights. And uh, I really appreciate what David shared about our community. Uh, recently, I just got done reading a book by Jeff Speck, The Walkable City and the Rules, and there's about 101 rules. And when we're talking about budgets, I am very much convinced that we should be looking at what Jeff Speck's done in this book to help our city grow in a healthy way. Because honestly, the reason why I come to a lot of the meetings in the past is always to represent our working poor for those who are cycling or those who are walking. Um, nobody else is going to speak for them. And the truth is they're so busy trying to get uh, around and meet all the requirements they, they have to meet and try to maintain a living for themselves that they're probably not going to show up in a meeting like this. So I really do, again, appreciate what uh, David Heinhold has shared with you guys. And I want us to really look at potentially looking at Jeff Speck's book and the two books that he's written as a model to reduce some of our expenses and invest into our infrastructure. Again, I live in Pettigrew Heights. Um, there, are, there are people that are driving in our inner city at in excess of 25, 30 miles an hour. Um, and when we put bump outs in, which the city has already started doing, or we put road bumps in to slow down traffic, people get safer. Um, one of the biggest issues that I'm struggling with right now is two of our attenders from our church, and we are at 700 North Main. Uh, so just north of it, one recently was struck by a car coming off of 2nd uh, and Main. He was crossing at the light. The, the police report said that he was in the clear to cross the street. But because we've increased the ability for people to drive on Minnesota faster, the driver didn't see him. Struck him. And now he's, now, and he's one of the working poor. And now he has to deal with how am I going to get health insurance because he doesn't have health insurance. He doesn't know how he's going to pay for his doctor bills. He's probably going to require surgery. Um, and then about a month ago, one of, our, uh, one of the other attenders at the church, he was struck on a bicycle and left for dead. He was literally hit and left on the ground. The driver of that vehicle drove away and left him abandoned. So again, I think there's some great models out there and we're a great city. They're doing great things. I just want to encourage us to maybe look at what Jeff Speck's done 
so that we can learn more from other cities that are improving their ability to make it walkable as well as uh, more cyclable. Because if we do that, we're actually going to put more money into our economy. According to Jeff Speck and a lot of his research is that economies that improve areas like cycling and walking, their economies grow with those type investments. So, uh, and as well as making it safe, making it safer for our community. So again, thanks and I appreciate all that you are doing. Thank you, Jason. Anyone else here to speak on this topic tonight? Please come forward. Good evening. Mark Weber. Um, I've had training a long time ago as, a, as an economist, even though I haven't earned a penny from that as a, as a profession. But I think the people on the city council know me because for more than two years I've been contributing more detail of municipal sales tax than what Mr. Pritchard does um, in uh, informational sessions. Right now the city finances are in pretty good shape as far as both property tax and 12-month uh, uh, rolling growth rate of um, municipal sales tax, which just last month reversed a three-month trend of going down, that it's now over 5%. I'm not a soothsayer, but uh, some people get paid for Looking into the future a little bit, economics has cycles. Um, and there's some speculation within the economics profession when the next recession is going to be. Sioux Falls is not exempt, even though in the, in the past, um, at least the news media always tries to say that it's more of a soft landing here. Um, the one thing I've been paying attention to is uh, that some economists pay attention to as an indicator of a future recession is this bond market inverted yield curve. In the last 50 years, either five or seven of the last recessions, that is a pretty good um, warning, warning sign. I'm not really convinced that the increase in government expenditure for 2020 versus 2019 is, is going to be feasible, even though I know we've got a 25% reserve and that's way above that. But two of the people that are in the profession that get money from this, Ernie Goss of Creighton University and Mark Zandi of moodyseconomy.com, um, they, they've got their economic feelers up that something's going to happen in the near future. As I said, I'm not a person that is going to uh, soothsay of what's going to happen in the future, but I hope this city council has in mind that there are downturns in economic cycles as well as growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input, Mark. Anyone else here to speak tonight on this topic? All right, seeing no more public input on this, we'll first see if there's any questions for Sean on the budget overall, and then we'll move into amendments. Any specific questions for Sean right now? All right, then uh, let's get a motion on the floor to approve this item, please. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Selberg. All right, motion on the floor to approve by Councilor Erickson and seconded by Councilor Selberg. Uh, discussion, Council. Any discussion? Any amendments? Are we reading them, or is, is the clerk going to read them? Do, oh, okay. do you want to start, Councilor oh, Steele? Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm going to make a motion to amend the main motion uh, to amend the 2020 General Fund Parks and Recreation Expense Budget to fund twenty thousand dollars for three cement ping pong tables within the City of Sioux Falls Park Department. Funding to come from the Parks and Recreation 2020 Operational Budget General Fund. All right. So we got a visual on the screen. You want uh, we we'll we we'll to? I think second we need a that. second. Is, is there a yeah. second for that item? Second, Brecky. All right. Seconded by Councillor Brecky. Now go ahead, Councillor Staley, if you want to speak to that. Uh, yes. And I, uh, first of all, I wanted to um, just to say um, I appreciated Sean Pritchett, um, his willingness to listen to us. We had a, 
a budget uh, working session earlier this year, I believe it was in March, and for people who aren't aware of how the budgeting process works, the mayor and his department heads work to put together their priorities, and then they bring it to us and, and present um, the budget to us. We've been sitting in um, meetings for the last six weeks or so, listening to the proposed budget. Um, but it, I've always felt since I've been on the council that it would be nice if we could get ahead of that and put some of our um, priorities that we've heard from constituents into the, the, the mix before it's formalized. And one thing that came out of that was the state theater out of our bu budget working session that, th that was listed as a high priority. And another thing that was a high priority, of course, is, is streets. Uh, and then uh, police was also a high priority. And let me say that uh, Chief Burns, um, we, we aren't, you aren't going to see any amendments to add more energy to the police force um, in, aside from what they've proposed because we were told that there's a limited amount of police officers that can be trained each year because of the limit that the state does for education. So that's something we're going to be looking at, I think, is, is asking the state to offer more training, for, um, especially for our community as our need may be growing. So anyway, moving on, um, the priorities are here. Um, I, I use Facebook a lot. I know our mayor does as well to listen to constituents. And um, back in July, someone reached out and said, hey, Teresa, what do you think of this uh, table tennis ping pong idea? And there was a video on Facebook. We can't put that on now to show you because of uh, legal limitations. But it, it looked kind of neat. And so I kind of threw it by a few people. And I, I put it on, I shared it on my own Facebook page. And wow, people were like, yeah, that looks kind of like a cool thing to do in our parks. And so I uh, had our budget analyst reach out and, and get some pricing on them. And they, they run about $5,000. And we rounded up the information, and we met with the park department. I took some counselors in with me. We talked with Don Kearney and, and one of his staff members about this, and he seemed somewhat excited about it. And as we were talking about it, we said, you know, we'd let you determine which park to put them in, um, maybe something by the bike trail. Uh, up to, that's totally up to you. And then we, we met with city finance department and kind of talked about what could work with that. Um, and we, we were, we've been assured that if this would pass the council, um, that it would be uh, put as a top priority within the park department budget. Um, also, I, I met with my colleagues, got input from them on this. And I, I also put it on Facebook and, and got input from constituents and people were excited about it. I, I did, I do want to say that we would this would be considered the same thing as playground equipment when it comes to um, you know the city's responsibility for keeping it up, um, and you'd have to bring your own ping pong paddles and and balls just like you do when you play tennis, or if you're going to go and play a game of basketball or football, so you'd have to bring that with you. Um, so and it's also would be up to the the park department to dis, to look for the 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 lowest bid, so to speak, or they don't have to go with the lowest bid, um, but I would leave that up to their discretion. So that um, that's where that is, and so that's all I have to say. All right. Councilors, do you have any discussion on this or questions for your colleagues on this? Councilor Recky? I, yeah, I just want to offer my support. I did sit on the, in the meetings um, discussing this subject with Councilor Staley, and I think one of the things that intrigued me the most about it and, and got me the most excited about it is so much of our park system is kind of focused on the playground equipment for children. Um, and there's limited, you know, ex experience for adults. I mean, we have, you know, basketball for the teenagers, and I guess some adults do use basketball too. But the thing about a ping pong table such as this is it's really universal. Pretty much anybody um, can, can, can become adept at it. So it really would attract 
It can attract a teenage crowd. It can attract an adult crowd. And it can attract a family crowd. And again, wherever the Parks Department puts it in order to kind of experiment, in, there's just several, you know, there's just multiple opportunities, I think, as to the placement of it. But, you know, they're going to try to use these three to, in different locations to try to figure out, you know, if it is the kind of thing that, get, that gets people excited. But to me, I think one of the things I really liked about the idea is it's just that broadening that, that park experience, you know, to, you know, virtually anyone. Um, and it could be used in, in many ways. So I don't, th I think it's fairly low cost. It's kind of the idea is to kind of pilot, pilot it with the three and kind of let the parks department be strategic about where they locate them to, you know, so that they can gauge the experience and then see if, you know, there might be more opportunities down the road, you know, for more of them. So I'm, I'm excited about it. It was a, a fun conversation to have, and I think it's a, a fun idea, and I hope that uh, my fellow council members will be supportive. All right. Thank you, Councilor Brecky. Any other discussion on this one, Council? All right. Well, I'll call for a vote on this amendment, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley. Yes. All right, that item passes six to two. So we're on the amended main motion. Uh, I look for another amendment. Okay, Councillor uh, Staley. So I, I, my second um, amendment. Uh, I make a motion to amend the main motion to amend the 2020 General Fund Parks and Recreation Expense Budget to fund fifty thousand dollars of a project trim assistance for qualified residents within the City of Sioux Falls. Funding to come from the Parks and Recreation 2020 Operating Expense Budget General Fund. All right, motion on the floor for that. Is there a second? Second, Brecky. All right, that's seconded by Councillor Brecky. Uh, Councillor Steele, do you want to walk through that amendment? Thank you. And um, well, let me say that uh, we have a, a program in our community. It's been around since, uh, I think... Director Kearney said it's, it kind of came around when he came on board about 2015 or 2005. Yeah. So, so what that uh, what our project trim does is it it goes out and surveys areas, and then it um, designates it looks for branches that are aren't within our parameters of safety, and then it puts gives the homeowner the notice that they can either um, do it themselves or they can hire someone. And so for some time, it's been my desire that we could become a community that would provide that for our residents. I, I don't know that that's going to happen in, in the near future, especially we got the emerald ash borer that we're dealing with. And now, we, of course, we have our, our latest tornado situation. But I, I got a, a, an idea about a, a, a pot, well, this kind of a pilot program, but a, establishing a fund for people who would fall into a hardship category. And an example I always use is my neighbor who had been part of this project trim uh, area and she had lost her job, her name was Sheila. She had lost her job and the, the tree trimmers came around, she was kind of, you know, real uh, somewhat intimidated because, you know, she didn't want to get fined or anything. And, and she ended up spending $300 to have her tree trimmed that she didn't have. And so what I'm proposing is that we, we come up, we have a $50,000 fund and the park department, again, I, I did meet with them. They were, they were open to it. And, and originally it was 100,000 I was looking for. But through dialogue with my colleagues, I reached out to all of them um, and met personally with, some of them met with me and we took it from 100,000 to 50,000 just to try, start out and to see if it's even utilized. Maybe there's not a need, maybe I, I'm reading this wrong. But that way someone who's on a fixed income, um, maybe disabled, they've got a hardship financially, they can get some assistance with the project trim when it happens. And as I, I said in these discussions, I can afford it, we can afford it, but there are some people in our community who who I don't, I believe, can, cannot. That would be a hardship. So I'm leaving this up to the parameters of the park department. And again, I, I've been assured by our um, finance department that if this passes, that this would be put at a priority within the park department budget. 
of the 50,000, but leaving it up to uh, the Park Department to determine the criteria of who would qualify, modeling it perhaps after the swim pass, um, free and reduced swim pass uh, situation or bus passes that you, you come up with some way of, of uh, having that modified. Councilor Neitzer, when we discussed it, said he, he thinks that it should be somewhat have a financial uh, impact, income based. So this is just a, a shot at trying to to help out and give it a shot and see if it if it would um, be of use. All right. Thank you, Councilor Staley. Uh, discussion amongst the council on this one, Councilor Brecky. I'm supportive of this um, motion as well, and you know, am familiar with you know uh, Project Trim. And I, I, but I, I thought I was really, but actually I learned a whole lot more about it. And, you know, the city had used to years ago actually provide the service and there was no project trim. But I was converted, I guess, during the process to understand how effectively as overall project trim is working for the city. But one of the things that is um, happening is also as a result of these discussions is experimentation with a pilot program um, where the city would come into a certain neighborhood and perhaps trim the trees. And the Park Department, um, without a budget amendment, has agreed to, to do that in a four block area. And the concept there is, you know, not maybe, you know, really moving down the road of the city, ultimately maybe taking over the full tree trimming responsibility, but more in the sense of maybe having um, some funds to float that opportunity into certain neighbor neighborhoods or for certain the opportunities maybe something to do with projects nice and keep they already do some tree trimming as part of that or just maybe you know a neighborhood of need so they're going to experiment with that program and learn the costs you know just how much the costs are and if it is cost effective and so that's happening as well and so then the secondary issue then is you know this a budget amendment which kind of addresses the issue of uh, again the working poor that we're talking about earlier and heard some of our from our public citizens that we need to have um, you know, that we need to be cognizant of that that population is ever growing in our community and, and does really, some of them, these things that seem relatively small really make a big difference. So um, I'm supportive of this because I, I do think that the criteria are kind of already established. It's going to be fairly easy to implement. It'll be a good test to see how many people actually use it and need it. And it'll be added to the brochures so people can just, you know, uh, contact them if they, if they, you know, do seek to have that opportunity. So. I think it's a good test for us, and again, both of these together, um, I think are just a good experiment for us to learn and to be, you know, helpful of our be again be cognizant of those neighborhoods that need our help, um, though that working class that you know needs a little extra from from its government. So I will be supporting this amendment as well. All right, thank you, Councilor Councilor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I know this project has been a sweet spot and of particular interest to Councilor Staley for a long time. I think she's made some good points and arguments, and I always appreciate the fact when counselors take the time to sit down with all of us and kind of work through what they're thinking and why they're thinking that. So I think it's a program worth pursuing, and I'll be uh, very interested to see the results in the next year and in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Counselor. Any other discussion on this amendment amongst the council? All right. Let's call for a vote on this, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that one passes eight to zero. I know there's a few more amendments on the floor. Councilor Sale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I make a motion to amend the main motion, amend the mayor's 2020 operating expense budget, the general fund, by deleting $124,361 and the position of Chief Cultural Officer. Funds will remain in the general fund fund balance. All right, a motion on the floor for that. Is there a second? Second, Star. All right, seconded by Councillor Starr. Councillor Sale, you want to speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You uh, <clears throat> first off, I'd like to explain to the public and those looking, the mayor could have hid this in the personnel budget and just said we needed additional personnel. So I really appreciate him bringing his thoughts to the forefront about the culture of the city of Sioux Falls and the operational government. And the previous mayor we had was a runner. This mayor is a runner. Previous mayor we had always wore a tie. 
this mayor chooses not to wear a tie most of the time. He has already changed the culture in the city as far as city employees go. In my 40 years association with the city government, 20 as an employee, the mayor sets the tone. Changes every four years or eight years, depending on the election. But the mayor sets the tone, and that changes from time to time. This mayor has done a good job with setting the tone for the city employees. He can abdicate his authority, but he cannot abdicate his responsibility to set the tone for the city employees. He's done a great job. I think this is an unnecessary position because it ultimately lands back on the mayor, no matter if he hires somebody or does not hire somebody, to execute that. So that's why I propose to eliminate this and continue to support the mayor and the good job that he's done. Thank you, Councilor Sale. Uh, other discussion amongst the council on this one? Councilor Brecky. Um, I will not be supporting this amendment. Uh, I do respect the differences of opinion on it, but and I would some of the, the things I would say are the same as what Council Member Sale is saying, but I would use those same arguments as a reason for supporting the position. And what I would say in the same vein is, yes, it's the mayor's job to set the priorities for the city, and it's his job to establish the organization um, that suits his needs and the needs of the city. And I don't know a single mayor um, that has come in and hasn't, one of the very first things that most mayors do, every mayor does when he comes in, is change the organizational chart. If you follow the history of the executive orders and you look at the organizational charts for the city, you will see that's one of the first thing every mayors do. Well, why do they do that? They do that because they understand their own talents, they understand their time commitments, they understand their needs, and they need to create an organization that complements them and supports them. And this mayor has said, one of the very first things he did when he got here was focus on the employees in a way that's never been seen by the city before when he st started and implemented his one program. He tapped into the employees, he, he utilized them and their input and their feedback as you know, and created really a team. And I don't believe that's ever really been done in the history of the city of Sioux Falls. So when he came forward with this position, it was no surprise to me that one of his priorities for this city is the employees. And he wants his fingers on the pulse of that. So I would be hard pressed, quite frankly, not to give any mayor the position that he wanted on his own team unless he was being excessive. This member, this mayor has not been excessive with the, the, the employees that he's added to his team. He's got two chiefs of staff with a serious responsibility um, operating in to, two total completely different areas and one administrative assistant. So if he wants to have his fingers on the pulse of the culture of this city to consider to, ca to, to, to um, capitalize on the one program that he started, you know, by by nurturing that culture, by you know, m making sure um, that we pay attention to recruitment and, and, and retention. And yes, I, I read Jennifer Holson's uh, statement and it's true, we haven't had a problem with retention and uh, recruitment in the past, but this next decade, um, we have larger businesses here than we've ever had before. So we've got large employers with lucrative job offers and it's going to be different, and it's going to be different because there's going to be a lot of employees retiring, and so we're going to be having to compete in a realm that we've never had to compete before. So if our mayor wants to be, make it one of his priorities to focus on the competition, to posture ourselves for success, and he wants his fingers on the pulse of that, he's got my full support. And so I will be fully supporting this position and understanding that at some point he may spin this position out of the mayor's office into HR, but right now he wants his fingers on the pulse of it. It's totally consistent with his one program, and I'm in full support. Thank you, Councilor Brecky. Councilor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilor Sale is, uh, as usual, is well thought out on his points and programs that he does bring forward. We had a good conversation today. He does have, again, a number of good arguments. Um, he and I think have been kind of going back and forth on this a little bit for a few weeks, as a lot of folks have. I tend to think of it, it kind of comes down to it with a couple arguments that I've heard that stick in my mind on this particular position. And first of all, when you, you know, the salary and benefits of the position, of course, are a big target because it's a pretty big salary and benefit. 
But when you talk about, number one, the, the figure of $20,000 per employee when, they're, when they turn over to replace these people, um, the number of retirements is, has been talked about in the next three to five to seven or eight years that are coming. Um, to me, it just kind of, yes, it's a big number, but let's, you know, take 20,000 times how many employees is that if you make a difference of a handful, you've already paid for the position, if not more. Um, the only thing certain in life, you know, obviously has changed. This is new. We've never seen anything like it, but the workplace is certainly new. <clears throat> Nothing like we've ever seen either. When we get to be five or 10 years down the road, you know, it used to be you'd have to be at a job for 25, 30 years to get a gold watch. Nowadays, I think people feel like they deserve one if they were at the same place for three to five years. It's just a different workplace. So we're going to continue to have people going in and out to keep people around and in jobs is going to take more of a focus. I do think the mayor sets the culture. I think he will continue to do that, but I think that this particular person is needed to focus particularly on the needs of people and how to keep them. So I guess... Just looking at the big picture, I do think it's the, the right move for the long run. What I would like to see from the mayor and the administration any year, if this does go through, is just kind of see some results. What has happened since we did this? What are the results? Has it made a difference? And maybe we can reevaluate a little bit at the time, but for now, I will be in support. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Kiley. Thank you. Initially, when I learned of this position, I, too, was skeptical. Um, thought and immediately thought that maybe we could use the position in the police department. The very next day after the uh, budget presentation, I contacted the chief of police and learned more about why that's not possible, the difficulties associated with that. But then as I researched what a um, culture officer does, uh, I I learned much more about the position and then had the opportunity to, to meet with the mayor and learned more of his thoughts on the position on the position. I came to realize that yes, this is about uh, empowering our employees and really it's it's really about establishing trust. Trust throughout the organization and that's got, it has to be a two way trust from administration, from management down to staff. Staff has, has to realize that they can actually uh, feel free to venture and uh, maybe even take what I like to call calculated risks uh, to improve what they do within city government. And it takes a certain culture to feel like you're empowered in that way. And this, this position is aimed at doing that. And then at the same time, too, the obviously the administration has to trust in their employees to do their jobs to the best of their abilities and also to look to improve themselves and to improve the organization, in this case, city government. Ultimately, this is all designed to improve better service to our citizens because uh, an individual that feels good about himself, yes, that uh, feels empowered uh, is going to deliver a much better product to the citizens and ultimately that's what we're all here here for and we do have some challenges ahead with retention because uh, with a 2.5 percent or under unemployment rate it's really an employees an employee friendly environment and uh, individuals don't have to look very far to find another job that if, if dollar amount is their, their goal, that's, it's not hard to find that. Um, and then with, as, as mentioned, the number of retirements that are going to take place in the relatively near future too. And every time we lose an individual, a lot of history goes out the door with them. And it's tough to get that back it takes many, many years to get that degree of knowledge back with a new individual, not to mention the cost involved in training them too. So the, the more we can do to retain our individuals uh, and to empower them to do their jobs, I, I think uh, better off we are going to be as a city. So I uh, will not be supporting this proposal. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Neitzer and then Councillor Starr. First of all, this is something that I shared. I, I think, and, and this is not to be critical, but I think the name was maybe, um, could have been a little bit different and because and, I think the culture officer thing, the culture piece, I, I get it, but you know, if it maybe been, you know, employee development officer or something like that, maybe it would have been a little bit better. But uh, <clears throat> that notwithstanding, a, as I've thought about this, first of all, there's a lot of merit to this discussion because employee development satisfaction is huge, huge. Um, it, the more happy that employees are, the better they're going to serve the citizens. And, and by the way, at this point, the employees are outstanding. The way in which they, they serve citizens, I mean, it's, it's second to none compared to any other governmental entity that I've dealt with. Uh, I, I guess what I'm struggling with is it's really important, but I'm not entirely sure that I've had the problem defined to me and that this will, whatever the problem is, that this will solve the problem. I, as an example, I would ask myself, data-wise, for the employees that are leaving, why are they leaving? You know, if, if, if we got some exit interviews, which I know HR does, what would they say? I, are there a lot of employees that would say to me that I, I didn't feel like I was fulfilled or, or that I was or that I had, my job had meaning, or that I felt empowered, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. Some anecdotal examples that I know of, of which I won't mention names, for them, it, was, it really came down to they were superstars, and the person, the, the next logical place to go, there was somebody in that slot, and they were going to probably be there for 10 or 20 years. And, you know, they just wanted to do something bigger, and they just chose to leave the city, f figuring that this person's been in it for 20 years, so they're going to stick it out with their pension. They're not going anywhere. So I'm not sure whether or not it's a problem of culture or if it's just structural. And, you know, when you have the step system and maybe you top out and then you're kind of sitting there trying to figure out where am I going to go, you know, I, so d is it culture? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. What is HR's role in this? Wh where is HR? Are they doing this? How about the directors? I would think, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, H, that directors are identifying who are the superstars in my organization? Who do I think ought to probably, you know, I know this, this person over here is going to retire in the next few years. Who do I think is probably going to be the best person to, to go over there? And what can I do to, to develop them or to help groom them, as it were, so I can get them to apply? And I, I suspect that's happening. And if it isn't happening, it it should be happening. So, again, I think it's a really good discussion, and so I'm not making any light of, of the idea that we need to empower employees and we want them to have meaning and help to train them and give them the tools that they need and give them the education or find out what's that missing piece that you need so you can get to that next level. But does this do it? I'm, I'm just not so sure. I think we need to have a better handle on the problem, if there is a problem, and that will help to define the solution. And until that's done, I don't think I can jump to solution without having the problem defined. Thank you, Councillor Neitzer. Councillor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm approaching this a little bit differently. I appreciate what Councillor Neitzer said. Where I'm struggling with this is that by the end of the night, if we approve this position, we'll have added 37 FTEs. We continue to grow government. We continue to take more money from our taxpayers. I believe in a $500 million budget that uh, we could scrape together and repurpose an employee to take this position or um, vacant positions that already exist. Out of those 20 employees that we're adding in this budget, you know, I'm struggling to see where the four are going to get filled in the, the police department's budget. I think we, we falsely uh, make our citizens feel more secure by saying we're adding four more uh, officers. I know it sounds bad, and it, it does, but the, the realistic thing that we're not doing tonight is doing anything to, to make sure that if we could hire those employees. So I'm strictly looking at this from a budget 
um, standpoint. And I would encourage the mayor to go back and, and find the, the funds through other departments, through the 500 plus million dollars that we're gonna allocate tonight and find this uh, and, and make some cuts uh, to get where we need to be. And that's why I'm supporting this amendment, not because I'm opposed to the, the idea of the culture officer and some of the things that we need to do, but I think that money's there to uh, do that. I think if the council was proposing this, we would find the money somewhere to add this without having to, to increase taxes and, and do the thing. So this is my way of at least taking a shot at uh, lowering and decreasing the size of the growth of our, our local government. Councillor Erickson. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Um, I have more to say, but what you said sparked a, a question to me that I would be curious if this council, uh, if it does fail, if this council would be okay with the mayor reorging and doing it. I mean, would you feel if we voted this down, would you feel that he sidestepped you to bring this position that he still wants? Because technically he could do that still. And that's the suggestion that my, my neighbor here said. And I don't know that I agree with that, that if we say no and you go ahead and just do it, I think that's a really bad precedent for us as counselors to not be respected. Um, he could have done it already. And I think he could have hit it in the budget and other places. And it's no secret that I've struggled on this. I've talked to each and every one of you on the council. I've talked to friends in corporate America. I've talked to friends in government in other cities. I've talked to other just folks all over. And this has been a hard one for me. It's really, really been a struggle for me. Um, you know, when we talk about government growth and growing these extra 37 employees, Let's not forget how many employees that were reorged in the beginning and repurposed and a lot of these jobs that, that did come forward were for the vision that this mayor had. And I support that the mayor should have his vision of where these employees should go. Where I struggle is that, does this belong in government? Why shouldn't it? You know, I've struggled with, with that back and forth that well, this is government, this doesn't belong in government. Well, maybe it does, and research is showing that it is going in there. Um, my concern with some of this is, let's be honest, when we all get asked to speak at stuff and they see me walk in, they're like, oh, I wish it was the mayor. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it is. They don't want to see me. They want to see you. And so the mayor just has a different clout. And so my fear is, is if this does pass, that, and I know your heart and your vision for this, and I know you're not going anywhere, but I don't want to see you go anywhere because the employees want to see you. They want to see your tone. They want to see you step up. Um, should this been in HR? Maybe, maybe not. But I know that it's such a new concept for us to all kind of grasp and process that in the first year, having your hand on it might be the best way to get that change of thinking throughout government. Um, this has really been the shiny ball of this, this um, budget, if you will, and kind of where we've spent a lot of time talking amongst ourselves. I've spent more time researching this. Um, I appreciate the job description was forwarded on, and that's something maybe a little unprecedented that sometimes we do approve jobs that we don't have that job, job description for, but I did want that, received it, and I'm appreciative of that as well. Um, but I can't support you going behind the backs of this council and saying, well, I'm just gonna do it anyways. I think that's a dangerous precedent. So whether this passes or not, I just hope that that is respected from um, the administration. Again, I've struggled, I get it. I know this person uh, reports to the chief of staff. I do feel that this would be a valuable position. Um, and so thanks for everybody as I've waded through all the pros and cons of this because it's been, it's been a difficult challenge for me, but I do see the benefit of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Erickson. All right, any other discussion on this? Councillor Kelly. I'll keep it brief. I just want to briefly address the idea that we're just growing government. You know, as the city population continues to grow at the rate that it is, we have a responsibility if we're going to continue to meet the needs of the citizens and provide the services at the same level that they've come to expect over the years, we have to also increase our employee base, we can't provide the services without the employees. It's not much different than when I was teaching in the Sioux Falls school system. As the, as the system grew in population, student population, our classroom ratio would have continued to explode, 
from the 25 to 1 or 30 to 1 to 40 or 45 or maybe 50 to 1. Uh, and we know, all know how we would feel about that as parents if we have uh, kids in the school system. And it's really not much different here. So I don't think that we're just growing government uh, for the sake of growing government. It's to meet, to continue to meet the needs of the citizens. Thank you, Councilor Kiley. Councilor Nicer. I, I did, I know that's a little off topic, but I, I had to say something just like Councilor Kiley did. Uh, just realize that of all of the employees that, that we're proposing to hire, except for this one particular position, nobody on the council brought an amendment to delete the rest, any of the rest. They could have. That should tell you something, that each one had to be proven that there was a need. We have one of the lowest employees per uh, citizens ratios in the nation. We're very, very lean. As, as just anecdotally, as an example, Public Works has been hoping for years to get, uh, I don't remember exactly what they call it, but um, the technicians that basically blow out the lines of, of the storm, storm sewer pipes and clean those out because they get full of debris from the storm sewers over time. It doesn't sound like a really exciting thing, but we go around the city and we do that. We've added hundreds of miles of pipes over the years and we haven't added any new technicians and they're having to go as fast as they can to get that done. By doing that, there's extra capacity in that storm sewer, which means that things don't back up and you don't have flooded homes, flooded properties, and you don't have all of this damage. Same thing goes with permit technicians and all of these things. We have all of these new citizens and the city continues to grow. We've been very, very lean when it comes to adding employees. We look at it really, really closely. So I just wanna make it uh, really clear that if you look through all of these, it should tell you something that Nobody else on the council, no one on the council is proposing to delete the other positions. And again, why is that? It's because we need them. Thank you, Councilor Neitzer. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go ahead and call for a vote on this. Just a reminder, no vote is to keep the position. A yes vote will be to eliminate the position per the uh, amendment. Vote, please. Council Member Brecky? No. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? No. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. And I will vote no. That passes five to four. Or excuse me, that fails five to four. Passes in my book, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're on to the uh, amended main motion then, and I know uh, there's another amendment that uh, Councillor Kiley wishes to bring forward. Thank you. Uh, I make a motion to amend the main motion to amend the Siouxland Library's 2020 operation expense budget uh, by reducing it by $25,000 and amending the communications 2020 operations expense budget by reducing it by $25,000 and amend the 2020 planning and development services operation expense budget by increasing it by $50,000 to provide additional funding for the Southeast Technical Institute for $50,000. Second, Erickson. All right, a motion by Councilor Kiley to that extent and seconded by Councilor Erickson. Councilor Kiley, you want to have the floor on that? Thank you. Um, last week during our informational when we had an opportunity to address our amendments, I talked about the $100,000 that we um, actually appropriated to uh, Southeast Technical Institute last year. And we talked about how a portion of that went to their vet tech program, classrooms to careers, uh, their telecommun telecommunications tower maintenance program, which by the way, is ours is, only, is one of only two in the nation. Uh, and then enhancement of ESL services. So I would like to see us continue down that path and bolster our uh, support, especially in two areas, that are near and dear to me as an educator, and that would be the classrooms to, to careers. Uh, 32 to 34 percent of high school grads do not go on to higher education. So uh, with the city's 
commitment to date and with additional commitment, uh, it's perpetuated a relationship with Sanford Health and First Premier Bank to provide needed career counseling and skilled training opportunities for underrepresented student populations in the Sioux Falls school system to help these students explore and consider uh, all options for continuing their education or obtaining direct workforce skills. Uh, in fact, that class is currently taking place uh, at Washington Senior High School now. Uh, and then the other area is the enhancement of ESL services. Uh, again, 32 to 34 percent of high school grads do not go on to higher ed uh, education, and uh, a bulk of them are in this particular come from this particular area. You know, I, I have long been a proponent of trying to resolve this workforce problem and dilemma that we have here. Uh, and I think one of the ways that we can de develop is just look right here within. We have a lot of individuals that, given the opportunities, are going to be very capable to be very productive uh, employees uh, in the future and hopefully right here. So enhancing the ESL assistance is important to workforce development in Sioux Falls as well as recruiting and retaining diverse students at uh, Southeast Technical Institute. Uh, and the funds will be used for startup expenses for development of an ESL assistance office at Southeast Tech, including staffing supplies and other resources for our uh, degree-seeking students. And these funds will also be used to leverage to gain more funding through uh, private and public sources, too, outside our own commitment. And this initiative aligns with the Aspire II Tech program, which helps lower level ESL students achieve early success toward their career aspirations. Once a student completes the uh, Aspire II Tech program, this new initiative will help these individuals to further their workforce skills into a Southeast technical program. Um, again, this available for any additional questions any of my colleagues might, may have. Uh, uh, Steve Williamson, the foundation director at Southeast Technical Institute, is also here to answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. We have discussion amongst the council. Councillor Erickson, start with you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit in about why the amendment was made as it is. As you all know, I'm super passionate about not uh, about us making amendments but not funding it somewhere. This simply is identified in these two areas. If the administration comes back and says, hey, we really want to use that from this place instead, those changes can be made just like they were last year. Um, just wanted to address that as we moved forward um, to know why those two places were sub, um, selected. Uh, it's my understanding that planning and development services just does not have it in their budget to absorb it at this time. And so we wanted to identify two other areas, uh, and that's what we did. Um, you know, recently I had um, coffee with a friend and said, you know, you went to a four-year school and, um, you know, you, you work in a, a different field. Why are you so passionate about this? And really it comes down to not everyone goes, education's changing. Not everyone goes to a four-year school. Not everyone goes to a two-year school. And if we can have certificate programs that get people working, uh, working for their families, and meeting those needs in our community for all sorts of jobs, um, I, I think Southeast Tech has been a, a wonderful program for us that they work with the, the business community to say, hey, we really need welders. And they had an amazing welding program uh, that I know actually Director Cotter and his son made, and they made some phenomenal products over the last couple of years. And so it's, it's things like that and stories like that that are really important to this city to making sure that all the workforce needs are being met. And so for those reasons, I certainly support this and hope that you will as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Other comments from the council on this one? Councillor Brecky? I want to thank Council Member Kiley for bringing this forward and also Council Member Erickson for bringing this forward last year. Um, it's an expansion to what we did last year, but I think we feel that we saw a good re are seeing a good return on our investment in the way that they're utilizing these funds. In particular, um, what brought my attention to this issue and, and what, my, what I'm so pleased about it is the classroom to careers part of it and the ESL part of it. If you listen to the comments that we heard from the public today about hate and racism and all of those things, and then you talk about these high school kids that aren't going on to further their education, 
And, and one of the things I wrote down when one of the citizens spoke, because I, I, I like to take notes when they sp speak, but she said, you know, language access is critical. And it's, it's a bigger picture issue. It's not, you know, the hate thing is tied to the education thing, is tied to the employment thing, it's tied to the unity thing. It's a big picture issue. And this careers to classroom program is amazing because they teach people English language while they train them in a skill. So instead of saying see Jane run or see Dick run, they're learning, you know, how to, they're learning how to communicate um, and they're learning the English language while at the same time they're learning to be a carpenter. I think, it's, I think that's innovative and creative and exciting. And he said to us that we could double, they got 40 people in that class, he has the capacity to double it like that. That's 80 people going out into the community that can now have a job and can speak. And I think that's huge. So I'm really passionate about that. And then the English speaking language program that they have in and of itself, I do see that as the linchpin to the future of our community. We have to be able to talk to each other and we're doing a pretty good job with the children of the immigrants that are coming into our community, but we're, we're, we're behind on what we need to do for the adults to help them get that leg up and to help them have a future. So I, I zealously support this, this amendment and I'm, I'm you know, just excited that you brought it and I'm excited and grateful that you brought it forward. All right, thanks, Councilor Brecky. Councilor uh, Starr, and then I'll go to Councilor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I have a question of uh, Councilor Kiley. Can you do the, the funding cuts again for me? Yes. Um, 25,000 is coming out of uh, Siouxland Libraries and 25,000 uh, by amending the communications budget and the 50,000 then going to planning and development services in support of STI. I get um, more of a procedural question than anything. We've already approved the library budget as part of uh, working with the county, haven't we? Can we amend that now? And I would have um, our finance officer address Sean, that. Sean, can you speak to that item, please? Yeah. I know we can. Why are you asking? I think we jointly funded them, but this would be applicable to the city's portion of the contribution. So I think from that respect, I don't think it would be a material issue. I would say, Tom, there shouldn't be a problem with that necessarily. So, Okay. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Councillor Kiley, or did you want to, like, Councillor Erickson, you can speak to this. Go ahead. It's simply a placeholder at this time, and that's it. It's my understanding there were some extra things that were done um, this year. Um, that were anticipated to be done in the future. And so uh, there's room to absorb it in that area. So it's not taking away from purchasing books. It's not taking away from the literacy programs. It's not taking away from any of those um, false things that want to be mentioned. It's simply a placeholder for this time because it cannot be absorbed in the other. Uh, it's, it's not going to do, it can be taken from other places. And it's my understanding that it was it was suggested that way because they were able to do a few things this year that were going to maybe be done next year, but it's already done. Got it. Councillor Kiley. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say that um, uh, Southeast, our efforts, and I think the efforts of the other partners of the Southeast Technical Institute have actually proven to be fruitful as their uh, fall enrollment this year is at 2,456, which is up from 2268, an 8.3% increase in enrollment in a single year. That's pretty phenomenal growth in, in enrollment. So kudos to Steve and to everybody else that played a role in that. And I'll say additionally that the credit hours taken uh, also increased on that side too. Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I just love this program. I think it's a lot like the you know, subject before the world is changing here too. I think the technical college is becoming the new cool. I think of something I saw on Facebook recently where they had a picture of Joe, the college student. It says, here's Joe. He looks down on those who don't go to college. He's now $100,000 <laughs> in debt living with his parents. Here's Jim, he went to technical college, he's an electrician, he's debt free making $80,000. So I just kind of like how we're putting a new framework on this too and that more people are moving that direction and thinking this way and I think our support and 
as you've said, a couple of different counselors over the last couple of years keep coming up with ways to support this, and I love it. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, let's take a vote on this one, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. So we're back to the amended main motion that's on the floor. And I believe, Councillor Neitzer, you have an amendment you'd like to make? Yes, I make a motion to amend the main motion to amend capital improvement program project number 14002 bike trail development by adding $100,000 in 2021 and adding the description Cherry Creek Trail Corridor Development Phase 1 Legacy Park to Family Park Construct 2021, page 86. Funds will be provided by Capital Improvement Project number 14037, water, Peter, water meter pit modifications by re reducing $100,000 in 2021, page 101. Second, Erickson. All right, a motion by uh, uh, Councillor Neitzert on that, seconded by Erickson. Councillor Neitzert, you want to have the floor and talk through that? Sure, and, I, and for the audience, I will tell you that my understanding is this is the last amendment, so we're in the home stretch. Uh, the Cherry Creek Corridor uh, would go from Legacy Park to University Center. It's also known as the West Side Bike Trail. It currently connects the main bike trail. Uh, the West Side Bike Trail connects the main bike trail at the confluence of Skunk Creek and the Big Sioux River near Minnehaha County Country Club. It, the West Side Trail would ultimately connect back into the main bike trail on the north end. This entire project is phased to allow a gradual construction over many years as funding would allow. Phase one is Legacy Park to Songbird Street, which is just near La Mesa and north of 12th Street. And then there would be a spur from Songbird Street that goes over to Family Park. The connection into Songbird Street would be a direct access for the Hayward neighborhood. The requested supplemental uh, that I deferred would fund the design and engineering of phase one. And just for reference, here's the existing bike trail. You can see the dotted line. Many of you obviously are familiar with it, but you have the bike trail that goes around the core of the city, and then you can see the west side bike trail that uh, goes northwest up to Legacy Park. Uh, the new connection would continue up towards Family Park. And I do want to also reference, since all I've been talking about is the west side bike trail, Project 14002 also includes, and it has not been deleted, uh, uh, planning to go from Lean Park out to Great Bear ultimately. So the east side is still in the, the, the plans. So the east side will get love as well. And go to the next slide. This is the design of the Cherry Creek ch Trail Corridor. And uh, north is going to the right. I violated, I think, maybe Councillor Sales requests that it always face north or always face up. But turning it just didn't work. It was going to be a mess and you couldn't read it. So this one I had to go to the right. So anyway, you can see that the red line from Legacy Park up to Family Park. That is the piece in which we are talking about. Here is the proposed alignment for phase one, which is what I'm proposing to uh, pencil in for construction in 2021. It's split into two priorities. The first one goes from Legacy Park up to Songbird Street. The second part is the spur that would go over to Family Park. Uh, you could do it in two pieces uh, very easily. Designing it in one piece makes complete sense, and that's something we will talk about in 60 days. But again, the intention is to design it in, in 2020, and this is a discussion to construct in 2021. Now, priority one, priority two, the phasing of the construction would really depend on finances. So the need, bike trails were identified as a top need in the 2019 Park Master Plan Survey. It's identified as a top priority in the 2019 Park Master Plan Survey. Survey respondents are very supportive of using sales tax dollars to fund. Uh, by the way, this is not a new thing. Every time we do surveys, bike trails are at the top of the list. Health and wellness and recreation for the west side residents and connectivity to the bike trail and alternate transportation for the west side residents, including the Hayward Elementary neighborhood, which I want to mention uh, that is identified as a food desert and there is a very large proportion uh, of those on a fixed income. So this would be a, a huge deal for them. So why now? The project has been literally in the CIP from 2012 to 2019. It's just been moving back and moving back. It's been pushed back many years. It was deleted from the proposed 2020 to 20, 
24 CIP. And I believe it's just time to get this project moving. Again, the schedule, the plan would be design engineering in 2020 funded by a supplemental appropriation. Uh, the entire project would need to be engineering at the same time for cost efficiencies and a proposed construction start in 2021. Here are the cost estimates. You can see that the, the uh, entire construction is a little over a uh, million dollars. The first phase is $636,000. Uh, it's, it's all going to come down to uh, funding, and we'll see how the 2020 budget year goes. Uh, it, it, and uh, we'd like to do all of it, but we, we have to just see how it goes, priorities, and we'll, we'll have that discussion. Construction costs break down again, 636 for priority one and then 384,000 for the second priority. Plan to fund the construction in 2021 during the 21 budget cycle, which will happen during 2020. We'll be able to determine the exact construction schedule and phasing based on available funding. And we'll see if we could do uh, one, two, or both based on the funding. Really what this is about is we are not appropriating. This is an out year. What we're doing is we're, we're placing it in the plan to make, make it clear that we consider it a priority for parks and that we want to see the project get moving. So it's about making a statement that we want to get build momentum and start the project. So the amendment is to add $100,000 in 2021 to the project. We would fund construction for the Cherry Creek Corridor Development Phase 1. Funding comes from 14037, which is water pit modifications, and that would be reduced by $100,000. Uh, that's essentially, again, a placeholder. We had to choose something. Now, this project essentially is a cyclical program that they do every year that uh, essentially they have to get um, backflow pre preventers above ground that are currently below ground because that's a building code issue. So I think they're going through the parks and they're working on getting all of them above ground. So it isn't necessarily a, a hugely time sensitive program if you really had to skip a year or reduce the funding for one year. So let's build momentum and make this a top priority in the parks budget and get the project moving. And again, I, I do want to mention that I'm confident that we will get the funding uh, for the design and engineering. And again, this is, this is a plan. We're putting it in the plan so we can have the discussion next year and we can make it a priority and just tell the administration we'd like it to be a priority. And then based on how funding and how things work and how life works, we will figure it out. So we can always make adjustments, but let's at least say, let's start the project going. So I ask for your support, thanks. All right, thanks, Councilor Neitzert. Discussion amongst the council on this initiative. <clears throat> All right, Councillor Neitzer. I and I, I did want to mention. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, um, <laughs> before <laughs> thanks. Honor. Before we have a vote, I did want to mention that um, for the uh, um, those who talked about um, walkability, um, I, I do want to mention that we do have that in in the plan, and we are increasing funding for walkability. We're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and so we have the complete streets policy. And uh, it's funny you mentioned Jeff Speck's book, Walkable City Rules. I bought about a dozen of them and I gave them to city staff. And then we met and we talked about it. And there's a lot of ideas that we took out of it. I, lo I love the book so much. So I gave it to anybody that I knew that had anything to do with designing a street mm -hmm. or a park or whatever else. So I have it we also. are working on it. The city considers the priority. We'll get there. Thank you. Any other discussion on this topic? All right, I'm going to call for a vote on this amendment then. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that amendment passes uh, eight to zero. So uh, we're back to the uh, amended main motion. And uh, are there other, any other amendments right now? Council? Oh. Comment. Do you have, you have an amendment to make? Comment. Okay, no amendments, any further discussion on this? Uh, Councillor Selberg and then Councillor Sale. Is it too late for a last minute amendment to fix the air in here? <laughs> uh, the, the, air is, the air is working, I just said something to Tom on it. Okay, so. then I'm good. <laughs> Councillor Sale. I'd just like to make a few observations on our overall city budget and I would like to point out to citizen Mark Weber who supplies us with some information that is diced and sliced a little bit different than we currently get that from Sean Pritchard and I appreciate that. 
the budget that we're going to work to approve tonight is mm -hmm. huge. It's just huge, 454 odd million dollars. And we don't take that lightly as city councilors. I can tell you we've worked very hard for our portion of this, and I know the city staff has too. It's huge. I have great concerns about the future of our economy in Sioux Falls. I expressed them last year, I've continued to express them. The Director Pritchard knows my concerns on that. But there are no hard statistical data to say that we are going to enter a recession and that the economy is going to turn. I just have grave concerns. So along with that, I'm going to vote to approve the overall budget for, for my vote, but I'm going to keep an eye on it and hopefully things don't turn bad and we can stay ahead of it because this is a great city and we saw that this last week about, well, I left here about 9.30 and as you know what happened about 11.30. So with all that said, I'm going to vote to approve the overall budget, but I'm greatly concerned about the enormity of a $454 million budget. Thank you. It's 545, 500, actually. 500, it just gets growing bigger the longer we sit here. <laughs> just grew by 100. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Other, Councilor Brecky. I would just like to add a few comments about the overall budget. And what I would say to you, Mayor, is I didn't offer any amendments to this budget. Um, I, I was involved with um, Council Member Staley's amendments and supportive of those, you know, and then as the others came up, I was supportive of, of most of them. The reason that I didn't offer any budgets is as, as I looked at this budget, and I like to think of myself as a big picture thinker, if I were to put together a budget, I would focus on infrastructure, i.e. streets. People have made it clear. <laughs> they want, that's what they want. And for over a year now, I've watched this administration focus on, you know, focus and encourage development in the core of this city, talking about growing up and not out, stopping urban, urban sprawl, walkability, bikeability, you know, get the developers to focus on fill-in in, inside where our infrastructure already exists so we don't have to build new sanitary sewer systems because they're already there and increase that tax base downtown. And then I talk about the three circles of growth. You know, as you develop your core on the retail side, then your service sector and those neighborhoods will improve because you'll improve those so that they can live and walk to work. And then you've got a really strong core. You've got a really strong core. That's really exciting to me. And then I would, I would think, okay, the other thing I'd like to see us do, and I, I talked to you, Mayor, before you, when you were just a candidate, and both of us, um, saw eye to eye on trying to deal with the city's social problems, homelessness, um, housing, um, mental health issues, addiction. And I've watched this administration, you know, focus, you know, start to turn the spotlight on those things with the triage center and all of that. So the reason I have no amendments is, you know, I don't have any particular, you know, small item projects, but this budget hits everything that's important to me. And when you gave your state of the city address, you know, I, I had nearly had to, I wanted to stand up and just jump up and down because those are your priorities. Those are my priorities. I'm really excited about this budget. I'm excited about the direction that we, you know, in support of you are taking this city. So um, I'm grateful for the work that you and your team did. And I'm just totally supportive of the overall budget and direction that you're moving in. Thank you, Councilor Brackey. Councilor Kiley. You know, I, I, I guess I have to agree with Councilor Brecky on that because uh, as this mayor knows, I'm not afraid to offer opinions or suggestions. And uh, I'm not afraid to do that throughout, throughout the year. So, I mean, the amendments that we had this evening, just a very, very small percentage of what the overall budget is. And I think, again, much of that is because the emphasis is in the area where it needs to be. Uh, our, our public safety and our roadways, number one. Both of them really are one, one, two. So thank you to everybody uh, uh, for the effort of everybody involved in our finance department and the directors. But uh, um, this is a little bit maybe a little bit out of line, but I'm gonna get a little shout out to Matt Newman with the finance as well. I mean, that guy is multifaceted. He was out with a chainsaw on Saturday, cutting the tree down, blocking my intersection. 
And I mean, so that just goes to show the quality of people that we have. So he cut you. it down to block it or to clear it? Well, he, <laughs> he, he cleared it to the best of his ability. And then another crew came by on Sunday and, and removed the rest. But man, I still have a couple of hangers in my backyard, though. Mm. So mm. thank you. Thank you. Councilor Staley. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Mark Weber as well. Um, for, for sending us your reports. And, uh, Sean Pritchett, I, lo I love what you do as well. But Mark's been so uh, loyal about figuring that out and sending it to us for the last two years. And I was having a conversation with my banker, and he echoed what you were talking about with this recession concern coming up. Um, and there's, there's, there's influxes and, and rhythms that I'm not aware of, but you who study the markets are. And I, I, I will rem always remember what happened on this council when our sales tax revenue was starting to diminish down to about 1.5 percent growth. And so just so the public knows that this, this budget is flexible. And if need be, we can always make adjustments too. This is kind of the wish list. And it's, it's all going to be based on what we bring in. So, um, but thank you for your help there, Mark. Citizens helping is a good thing. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess uh, um, Heath's not here tonight, so we get to gloat on Mr. Weber. So again, thank you. I know that uh, your emails are your strength, and it takes a lot for you to get up and testify before us. And I appreciate the, the numbers each month that you do share with us and the, the analysis that you provide. I think one of the things that the time that I've been on this council that I've really enjoyed about this budget process more than anything is that we started with uh, where our priorities as a council were, and they were kind of folded in with what the, uh, the administration's budget brought forth. Director Pritchett did a great job of listening to some of the things that we were concerned about at the beginning, and I think that being able that the council and the administration being able to work together to, to incorporate those priorities really made a difference. Again, I'm in, in the same position. I think I was with Councilor uh, Sale last year, you know, when Dr. Goss uh, starts getting concerned about the economy and his uh, uh, things, you know, we don't have a, um, an economist on staff and we don't necessarily consult one as part of this budget process. Um, I think we'll keep a close eye on the budget just like we do in this current year. That, uh, you know, a budget is a plan of going forward and there are many times during the course of the year that that budget needs to be adjusted. I'm not real concerned about how tight this budget is. I look at what happened in 2018. We had almost $10 million that the administration turned back, uh, basically half operational, half capital funds. Um, we have that ability and I think there's that padding in the, the budget that uh, allows us to adjust and make those cuts um, on the fly as we need to as the economy grows or contracts. So I'm confident that this is a good plan for the city to move forward. Um, and again, I'm just thankful to the administration for including some of our priorities as a council at the beginning rather than waiting for the amendment process tonight. I think it's made it a lot easier for most of us than other nights when uh, in the last three years when we've done, uh, we've had to hold back uh, information till uh, adjustments. I think it makes it easier for the uh, finance department to, to be able to work with them and there are no surprises. And I think last year they were surprised that we were totally honest with them and didn't hold back any of those amendments. So I think that trust is continuing to grow between the council and the administration. So thank you for everyone that's involved in the process, Director Pritchett and your staff, as well as uh, your analysts and each, of, each and every one of the department heads. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other discussion amongst the council? All right, we're gonna take a uh, vote on this item then, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We'll move on to our next item. Item 42, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing appropriations authorizing an increase in property tax revenue pursuant to SDCL 10-13-35 and the means of financing for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2020. Hi, Sean. Sean Pritchett with the Finance Department. Uh, the ordinance establishes the legal level, uh, legal level of spending for the fiscal year 2020 uh, for the city's governmental funds and tax-supported funds. The ordinance also establishes the annual property tax levy for, 
for fiscal year 2020, which includes the 2.4% state certified CPI or inflationary adjustment plus growth to support the budget that you just passed. The ordinance also needs to be amended to reflect the budget amendments just passed by you as a council. Thank you. All right, thanks, Sean. Anyone from the public here to speak on this topic tonight? All right, Council, do you have any questions for Sean on this item? Councilor Steely? So, Sean, if you would just, for the public's sake, uh, tell us how much we, we are currently taking in, uh, in in property taxes and then how much this increase will uh, be for this year. Um, I don't Except, have the correct separate. figure right in front of me. The amount Isn't it like 64 is million. Um, I don't. I'd have to grab my budget book here. Do you remember from last week? It's, it's six, 64, 67. Um, I, I'd have to get back to you on that here. I, I can tell you the inflationary adjustment is one and a half million dollars is the projected amount, um, and it would bring it to 67 million 641 thousand 905, which is estimated. Yeah, and included in the ordinance. S S 67, 105? That's the amount that's in the ordinance, yes, that's included in the budget for the property okay. tax levy. Um, that's, that's this year. The actual. Yeah, I got the 2019. 2018. Were you asking what we budgeted for 2019? Yes. So we had budgeted $63,829,859. And now it's up to six, about, about 67. Based on the growth of the city, so that includes the additional growth uh, of the property tax as well as the inflationary adjustment okay, for the 2.4%. All right, other questions for Sean on this item? All right, um, I'll look for a motion on it. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Kylie. All right, motion to approve by Erickson, seconded by Councillor Kylie. Uh, discussion on this? I'll make a motion, if I can, um, to amend to reflect changes from the resolution adopting the budget in the capital program. Second. All right. Motion by Councilor Erickson on that and seconded by uh, Councilor Selberg. Um, we'll take a vote on that and then go back to the amended main motion. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. So we're on to the amended main motion. Discussion on this amongst the council? All right. Move approval. We have that on the floor, so I, I'm going to actually call for the vote then. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? No. Staley? No. All right, that passes six to two. We're on to our next item. Item 43, first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, declaring certain real property of the city surplus and authorizing payment and exchange of city land with a private landowner. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, October 1st, 2019. Good evening, Brad. Yes, it's been going both directions. Is this one a cold one? Don't let the exodus of people kill you. I know this is important, so don't take it personally. There we go. Good evening, councilors, mayor, uh, Fire Chief Brad Goodwood here, along with Police Chief Matt Burns, uh, to present the Public Safety Land Exchange and Purchase Ordinance first reading. So the main topics of the ordinance are first uh, declaring land currently owned by the city as surplus, authorizing the exchange of city land for Crusher Investments property to be used for the future public safety training center location, and to authorize the city payment due at closing. So I'd like to highlight the fact that all this is contingent upon uh, the future bond approval by the council. I wanna talk about the great partnership that got us to this point. Uh, Jim Sukup with Crusher, Crusher Investments has been a very good partner um, working with the city in this project. Jim has worked very well with the city in the past. Um, this was a piece of land that was not listed for sale and the city approached Jim about this partnership, uh, about this uh, particular piece of land knowing that it would be a great location for our new public safety training center. Uh, Jim discussed the need to replace the sand reserve on this property and working with Public Works identified a piece of city owned property that has good sand reserve. The Public Works uh, water wreck has a master plan that is complete and this piece of land was not needed for that future expansion. 
So working through city real estate, we had appraisals completed on both properties and uh, developed a tentative agreement on this exchange. So this slide shows the location and the appraised value of each of the properties. I'd like to highlight the perfect location of this property as the future site of the city's public uh, safety training center. It's close enough to the city and infrastructure to make sense, uh, yet it's far enough out to be appropriate for this type of activity. And the surrounding area is properly zoned for this type of facility. Access will be perfect with the completion of Highway 100 to the east and 60th Street North becoming a four lane split road in the future. It also has Sycamore Avenue and 60th Street North interchange. That's an ideal entrance into the facility. This is a great opportunity for the city to acquire this property at this time from a partner that's been an excellent to work with uh, throughout this process. Good evening, councilors, uh, Chief Matt Burns. Just briefly wanted to show you the site again. I know this is about the third time that we've shown this to you. Just a matter of re review that shows you the topography here. Um, this is a current photo, again, of the Crusher Investments property we are facing to the west. You'll notice 60th Street North there on the south side showing Sycamore Avenue where it intersects with 60th Street North and dead ending at the property. And again, Interstate 90 is on, on the north side. Uh, the current sand mining area is prominent uh, on the east side of the property, uh, which is notable there. Once again, this is the concept overlay that we've spoken of uh, in previous discussions. Uh, that is uh, the concept again, so we are working towards uh, uh, the next part of the plan, uh, which would be the details. Approval of this ordinance is a very first important step of this project uh, as we move forward. This approval is needed to begin the schematic design phase, which gets us down to the exact, or closer to the exact uh, project costs, which we will need to go into the bonding process. And again, as a further designing each training component, component, and again, firming up the costs on the proposed site. So in just uh, the fine detail here to summarize, there are just over 102 acres of the Crusher Investments property, uh, and it has a value of 3.34 million. Uh, the 19.68 acres of the city, which we propose to exchange with Crusher Investments is valued at 730,000 for an ending of value and leaving 2.61 million uh, for the finalized purchase of the public safety land uh, pending again bond approval. And with that, those are the, uh, the details we would offer tonight, uh, pending your questions. Thank you, Brad and, and Matt. Uh, anyone from the public wish to speak on this item tonight? All right, counselors, do you have questions for uh, either the chiefs on this one? I move to set the second reading for Tuesday, October 1st. All right, I second. second on that, seconded by Councilor Sale. All right, discussion on this, Council? All right, we'll call for a vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Melberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. We're on item 44. Item 44, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 7201 West 57th Street from the RR Single Family Residential Rural District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, number 10950-2019, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval 5 to 0. The recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, October 1st, 2019. Jason. Uh, good evening. Jason Bieber representing Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is an application by William Hinks. Uh, the owner is Jesus Calling LLC. It's located at 7201 West 57th Street. Uh, it's about 1.73 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is they're looking at uh, demolishing the existing smaller church that's on the parcel, and then they're looking at constructing a larger church with uh, associated parking lot. Okay. Uh, anyone from the public here to speak on that item tonight? All right, counselors, do you have questions for Jason on this one? All right. Look for a motion to set a data second reading for Tuesday, October 1. So, so moved. Second, night, sir. All right. Motion by Kylie and seconded by Knight, sir. Any discussion, Council? We will vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Knight, sir? Yes. Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Haley? Yes. All right. That passes 8 to 0. Item 45. Item 45, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located north of East Arrowhead Parkway 
east of North Veterans Parkway and west of North Six Mile Road from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban LW Live Work and CN Conservation Districts number 10948-2019 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. The recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, October 1st, 2019. Uh, the applicant here is Preston Mettler. The owner is Joel Engel. It's located north of East Arrowhead Parkway, east of North Veterans Parkway, and west of North Six Mile Road. Uh, it's about 60.2 acres in size, size, excuse me, and the purpose of this rezoning is they're looking at constructing a single family, uh, twin home, apartment, and office development. All right, thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one tonight? All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Jason on this one? Councilor Erickson. Not related, um, but it was your birthday, so I think that we should let everyone know how just <laughs> your birthday. Technically, it's not my birthday until November, but I did have a birthday party. You did party. have a birthday party. Yes. Okay, well, I thought it was your birthday, so the joke's on me, I guess. November? <laughs> yeah. So, any questions? Well, my wife likes it because now I can celebrate for two months, so. <laughs> Hey, it's I'll my move birthday to tomorrow. <laughs> second reading for Tuesday, October 1st. Second. <laughs> All right, a motion by Councilor Erickson on that, seconded by Councilor Selberg. Any discussion on this one, Council? All right, we'll take a vote, please. Council Members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Item 46. Item 46, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 57th Street and Highway 11 from the I-1 Light Industrial District to the CN Conservation District, number 10781-2019, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. The recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, October 1st, 2019. Uh, the applicant and owner here is David Lawrence. Uh, this is located south of East 57th Street and west of Highway 11, uh, just to the west of Franklin Motors. Uh, it's about 1.6 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking to develop a detention pond as part of his light industrial development. Got it. All right. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one tonight? All right, Council, do you have any questions for Jason on this? Move approval. Second, kindly. All right, set a date of second reading for Tuesday, October 1. That motion's by Selberg, seconded by Kylie. Any discussion, Council? We'll take a vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Heitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Uh, item 48. Item 48, a resolution authorizing an application for financial assistance, authorizing the execution and submittal of the application and designating an authorized representative to certify and sign payment requests. Hey, Lance. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Lance Weatherly representing Public Works. Uh, first off, thank you for the support of the, the Capital Improvements Program. Uh, that's a major driving force for us uh, making a bet, um, bringing improvements to uh, improving the quality of lives of our citizens. This here, uh, what we're going to talk about is essentially asking for a resolution of city council's approval to submit uh, an application for SRF funding uh, to construct three drainage improvements projects. Uh, as you see in the map, they are located in the southwest part of Sioux Falls. Uh, the projects would encompass about roughly 14% of the uh, drainage improvements, capital improvements program. Uh, we do have a lot of pro projects all around the city, but these three here we've uh, identified for SRF funding. So uh, we have uh, quite a few basins uh, for drainage and we're using them to identify projects. So basin 104 near 49th and Louise, basin 95 near JFK Elementary near Holbrook and 54th, basin 371 is kind of near 41st and Sertoma. So the first project uh, we're going to talk about uh, briefly, uh, Basin 104. Uh, essentially, uh, this project is a capstone project of five projects that we've completed in the last five years. Essentially, near 40, 49th and Louise, uh, when we constructed that in 2017, uh, that project limit uh, ended a few, about a I think about a thousand feet east of Louise. So we're planning to construct, uh, continue a uh, much bigger storm pipe 
underneath 49th Street uh, and extend it over to Oxbow Avenue. It's going to be a, a 5 by 12 box culvert, essentially something you can drive a car down. There are other pipes in the road already, but this is the capacity that uh, we are looking to bring uh, this location to our current standards. Uh, Basin 95 near JFK uh, Elementary. Uh, this neighborhood uh, was built a lot in the 70s and 80s and with modern technology uh, we're able to uh, study drainage in a lot more detail and we've identified uh, a number of improvements uh, to bring these this neighborhood up to current our current standards as well. Uh, there are a couple options we are, are looking at. Uh, this is the recommended alternative uh, in front of you uh, with constructing additional detention, uh, some larger storm sewer pipes, and uh, quite a few various other uh, drainage improvements. In the last project, uh, uh, kind of north near, uh, near 41st and Sertoma to the north, uh, Basin 371, uh, we had a significant rainstorm in 2013. We actually had a car get stuck, got swept off the road, got stuck in a culvert. Um, we have a number of road crossings here that when we have uh, larger rainstorms, uh, we just uh, incur a lot of maintenance costs with just uh, the, the volume and uh, the velocity of the storm water coming through there. So we're looking to expand existing city-owned land that we already have to create additional detention. And some of the, our, our channels uh, require a lot of maintenance, so we're looking to provide some improvements uh, to essentially uh, dehydrate the cattails in our channels so uh, the stormwater flows better. So essentially uh, what we uh, are requesting is an SRF loan request uh, for $9 million. Uh, the principal, uh, the, the term is a 10-year note. Uh, two and a quarter percent interest. It's a great, great uh, feature working with DNR on that. Uh, with that, we do get a 1% principal forgiveness that the city is able to invest in non-point source projects. I'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, essentially, the timeline is uh, have the application of support in front of the city council tonight. Uh, September 30th, we're actually also doing a public meeting on all three of these projects. This is part of this uh, financial assistance program. Uh, submit the, fa the facility plan to DNR on October, 3rd, October 1st. Uh, the fourth quarter of 2019, we'll bring a bond, bond resolution back to you. And uh, after that, we're looking to construct uh, the 49th Street project in 2020 and we'll move into design with those projects uh, and, and ultimately bring those, those bid awards uh, to, you, to the city council. So as I kind of talked about with, uh, with the great partnership, we have DNR with these, the SRF loans. We're able to get uh, principal forgiveness to invest back into uh, non-point source water quality improvements up through the basically the Big Sioux and, and Skunk Creek watershed, we're able to do that. And with this project, we'll receive roughly a half million dollars to be able to do that to help in, uh, improve uh, the water quality of the, the Big Sioux River. So that being said, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lance. Anyone from the public here to speak on this, this one tonight? Come forward, please. Uh, Brian Burge. So speak on subjects of this matter. Uh, this event is approximately six and a half times larger than the sum total of any other budget dollar brought to the table. Historically, what I've seen as a trend with municipal government is as you get into these large under or in-ground uh, payment structures, you know, you're, it becomes larger and larger barriers of entry that only the most exclusive contractors can bid on as the background regulations, the bonding requirements go higher and higher. What I'd advocate as you move forward in this, investing a portion of these funds into trying to make these into bite-sized projects that smaller people, smaller contractors can take a hold of, you will open the floodgates of those who can bid on this type of project. And if you can trim 10% out of this, every other discussion that was head to, held tonight about dollars can be made up for. So as you try to make these projects go forward, try to keep a focus on how can we make them less restrictive, more bite-sized, that contractors of a crew of 20 people, those side of the world can actually bid on and stomach taking on by themselves, pre thus preventing the large contractors out of the Twin Cities, out of out-of-state dollars coming in and being the only three that can bid on a project of this size. All right, thank you, sir. 
Any other comments tonight on this item? All right, counselors, what questions do you have for Lance this evening on this, if any? Seeing none, I'd look for a motion on it. Move approval. Okay. Second. Motion to approve by Selberg and seconded by Neitzert. Any discussion amongst council on this one? All right, we'll call for a vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. We're on to uh, item 50. Item 50 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rescheduling the business of the city. All right, and Tom, you'll speak to this? Mayor, this moves the meeting of November 19th to Monday, of, from no, Tuesday, November 19th to Monday, November 18th. That's because four of the eight members of the council will be traveling to a conference out of state. Got it. Anyone from the public want to speak on that? All right, councilors, uh, can I get a motion on that, please? <laughs> Move to approve, Erickson. All right, is there a second? Second, Brecky. Seconded by Brecky. Any discussion there? We will take a vote, please. Council members Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We're on item 51. Item 51, a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, those being Robert Jarding and Brad Shoup to Jeremy Van Well, Paul Mance, Preston Mettler, Heath Taggart, and Joshua Muckenhurn. All right, easy for you to say. <laughs> Not Ten Haken was bad, right? Any, uh, anyone here from the public to speak on those items? Any of those folks here by chance tonight we can recognize? All right. Well, if you're watching from home, thank you uh, for your service to the city. Uh, Councilors, look for a motion on this. Move to approve. Second, Selberg. All right, motion approved by Kylie, seconded by Selberg. Uh, let's take a vote, please. Council members, correct? Yes. Council members, Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Elberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Uh, Councilors, any new business? Yes, we. Councilor Staley? Um, item 52. Um, do I read this or does the clerk? There's no new business. Uh, there's no new business, so uh, do I, yeah, do I read, read this? It. Does she read this? I'll How read does this work? It. I'll read it. Tom will read it. All right, you're on, Tom. Item 52, motion to strongly recommend to the mayor that he direct city employees and city contractors to begin immediately picking up all residential debris free of charge in the curbside boulevard areas that resulted from the Tuesday, September 10th, 2019 weather event. Councilor Steely. Do I need to make a motion to approve? Uh, you can introduce this. Oh, okay. Uh, and then we'll okay. Well, so let, let me say, uh, just for the benefit of my colleagues and the public, that I am going to be making uh, an amendment to this uh, as after the discussion to express appreciation to the mayor and volunteers for their efforts to at the beginning of this um, amendment. Um, let, let me say that this whole week, I think for all of us, has been a learning curve. Um, as Averis stated so eloquently at the beginning of public input that they were, they felt, felt that the city was a partner with them in helping to, to get through this tornadic activity. And, and I also think that communication is very, very important. Um, I did start reaching out to the mayor um, Wednesday morning at 943. Uh, I have a lot of people who contact me on Facebook and they started asking questions about how things were gonna progress onward. And so I've just shared a few emails or texts that I had back and forth with the mayor going into the next morning um, that people needed assistance. I did come home Wednesday afternoon um, and I saw these trucks in my neighborhood picking up branches. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. And I went up, I said, hey, what's going on? And the guy in the truck, well, we're picking up, uh, we're up here cleaning the neighborhood. I thought, wow, they're up here by McKinnon Hospital to start with. And then they went down to Riverdale in that area down in there and they were helping neighbors. Neighbors were really excited about it. So I was thinking, you know, we got the city out in force trying to help. Um, then 
again, people are contacting me. There, there seem to be like mixed messages happening. Uh, this was this came out on Thursday from the mayor, and it says debris in the boulevard or on private property are the responsibility of the property owner. If so, and I know we're talking about the volunteers coming in, but so there is like this question that I'm getting from citizens as, you know, what are we going to be responsible for? Is the city going to help us? And if you want to go to the next one. And then we had the uh, Argus leader reports that uh, beyond the streets in the boulevards, neighborhood cleanup efforts are the responsibility of property owners. So there it looked like the boulevards were being cleaned up by the city. And then when you go to the city's uh, website there, it says that um, the city and contractors are working to address boulevard trees and branches that have fallen into the public right away. So th it was trying to determine exactly what the city was going to do. And in the midst of this, I heralded back in my memory to 2013 in the ice storm when I, I wasn't on the council, but I remembered people being so appreciative that the city stepped in and helped with the cleanup effort. I didn't hear anybody say that they felt that they had um, been, they had a hardship put on them when it came to branches in the boulevard area. So then also I started getting emails from people and I've shared some of these um, that, you want to go to the next one, um, this person, I'm wondering if the city is going to be picking up debris from the storm damage. Tree companies, she said, have no idea if the city of Sioux Falls will be picking up tree debris like they did in the ice storm in 2013. Most companies believe the city of Sioux Falls will be picking up the tree debris. I would like to know if the tree company needs to remove the tree debris as we have a big tree on our house, major branches from a maple, not yet, okay, um, and a pine tree. If we, and the concern people had is if they put the debris out there, is the city going to pick it up? I did forward this email to the mayor um, in the midst of that because I wasn't sure how, what I should be telling her to tell the tree companies. Um, you can go to the next one. I'm writing on behalf of the Emerald Acres neighborhood that was hit very hard by the tornadic storms. And then they were, again, we're talking about getting this, the trees cleaned up and, um, how it's going to be handled. And, and I think what, ha so I've got several things here that we could go through, but I, I think what, what happened with some people is they were even taking stuff off the, and Councillor Kylie, I think, might even know about this, but people were actually taking stuff off the, the streets, cutting it up, putting it on the boulevard, and the city wasn't taking it. So it was kind of hit and miss as to who's getting serviced and who isn't getting serviced. And so in the midst of that, I put this resolution or this, this motion on the agenda. And in the midst of that, things start on oh, this woman had this thing in the boulevard. Well, I don't know if somebody's going to take care of that. I did. I was directing people to call 211. Um, but we, I'm glad we had a chance to talk about this. I think the, the volunteer effort has been huge. I will tell you that if you want to go to the last one there, Jim, um, well, and then this, this diagram t tended to make people real upset from what I got from, with, with the, the things, of uh, the lines on the sidewalk, go to the next one. And then it, it, got, it got modified to have these three options, which really, I think, calmed people down and they, they liked that. Um, and, Councillor Brecky and I helped, and I know that several of you were out there a lot, working very hard. But we were we were clearing stuff out of a neighborhood with this Team Rubicon, but we were putting it out and then go to the on Sunday, and the city was there picking it up. So again, I think that we just needed to work for some unification as to who's what's going to be available from city resources. Some people were getting it. I got reports from some people that the city went into their yard and cleaned out the whole yard. And then other people were having to have a dialogue with the city to say, you know, th this was this was your stuff to take. So I put the resolution out there, or excuse me, the the, the motion. I am going to, uh, like I said, I'm going to have a, I'm going to change, I'm going to put an amendment on it. Um, but I think, do we take uh, public input? Are you done? Yes, I'm done. Okay. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item tonight? Sorry, I'm going to have to read. I'm exhausted. 
Um, my name is Rich Sigmund. I live in the Emerald Acres uh, edition that uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Stelita has talked about. Uh, it's near the intersection of 69th and Minnesota Avenue. Tuesday, September 10th was my fourth tornado event. I've also been lucky enough to go through four ice storms and three hurricanes, but most of all that, except for the hurricanes, was at Fort, in Fort Sill when we lived in Oklahoma. Here's what transpired for my family and neighbors on Tuesday, September 10th, after the 10 o'clock news was finished, it seemed that the warnings were going to expire without any significant or dangerous storms to continue. Approximately 11.15, my daughter is telling us about a tornado warning on her phone. At 11.20, the winds picked up to about 70 miles an hour. A few minutes later, the winds were over 80, reminding me of our experiences in Oklahoma. Over 80 miles per hour, over 80 miles per hour, winds will lean a 25 to 30 foot tree at a good 30 degree angle. Uh, pick up un it will pick up unsecured items like trampolines, picnic tables, etc. We watched the trees bend, and when the lightning struck, we would catch a glimpse of the objects further away, in the air and, in and on the ground. At 1124 is when we heard, a large, we heard large objects hitting the si south side of our house. The wind switched from a heavy blowing sound to a roar, and it seemed like it was snowing outside. But this, was th but this snow was weird. Um, it was sticking like large spitballs on the windows along with the leaves. It was time to go in the basement. This wasn't snow, this was insulation from a house across the street. Having experienced 100 mile, pl 100 mile plus mile per hour winds before, this situation brought back bad memories of hiding in our safe room in Oklahoma. As we were heading to the basement, the power went out. I ran to the garage to get, to get a flashlight. When I opened the door to the garage, I felt the air behind me from inside the house rushing into the garage. I grabbed the flashlight. I could hear the air rushing and leaching through the seams of the garage doors. The pressure differential between the inside and outside was obvious. In the morning, I would find out, I would find that the attic panels for, and the access in the closets to go up in the attics were sucked in and pushed up and through the attic. Um, back to the storm, it was time to get in the basement with my wife and daughter. After 15 minutes, the horror show was over and I went outside to assess the damage and check on the neighbors. Jeff and Lorraine were okay. They had a tree limb the size of a billiards pool stick sticking through the exterior wall into their bedroom and hit the headboard. Uh, Mary Lee was in the hospital. Aaron and Kimber and the kids were safe. Nancy Hone is 70 years old and al alone. Her dad, Claude Hone, a World War II vet, had just passed away. She was shaken up, but okay. At 6.30 to 7 a.m., the damage destruction was obvious. You all have been around the city and saw it. 30-foot uh, evergreen trees uprooted, 40-foot cottonwood splintered. Uh, most maples were destroyed. The trees that seemed to fare the best were the uh, ash trees. Go figure. Uh, metal soffits, roofing shingles, drywall, particle board, you name it, was littered on the, on the lawn. I went down to Mustang Avenue. I met with Cam Larson, one of the city employees with the street department. She saw firsthand how the streets were impassable. We talked about the damage, took some pictures, and she made me aware that the EOC was in operation. The city was out assessing the damage. I felt, I felt some relief knowing that the city was out early and things were moving and the ball was rolling in the right direction. With the help of the neighbors, family, and friends, we broke out the chainsaws, tow straps, and pickup trucks to clear the streets. We felt that that was a priority and the right thing to do. We took a break around 10.30 to grab a cup of coffee, turn on the news, turn, the city and the, turn on the news and the city channel, turn them on. Felt relieved to know that the community knew what had transpired and that the city's EOC was operating. Day one ended around 9.30 p.m., grabbed two beers and watched the news to see what our uh, public officials had to say. I was hoping the city would react and help the same way as they did during the ice storm of 2013. I wrote an email to Rick Kiley and uh, Teresa Stelly as, all, as well. Um, day two, get up at 6 a.m., clear some trees for an hour, go to work for a little while, call Public Works in the street department. Whether I spoke with Mackenzie, Kathy, or Darla, um, they were all very helpful in explaining the situation and made me aware of some of the priorities that the city was working on. We were still just basically waiting for the information to come in from everybody that was assessing the damage. I, I felt comfortable knowing that the city was, go was going to help in some way. I wasn't sure what way that was, but some way.
Um, Rich, that's five minutes. Do you, oh, you have a point at the end that you want to get to? Because I'll give you one more minute if you want to get to okay. the point at the end. Well, I guess, uh, Mr. Mayor, I was just a bit shocked after, after two or three nights of going through the same process, two or three days, um, you know, uh, working the, clearing trees and debris in the morning, going out and uh, uh, running to work for a few hours, clearing until 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, watching news. Uh, you talk during the day to the city, and I felt comfortable that things were rolling in the right direction, that there was going to be some help. Not sure what it was, but some help. And then I watched the news at night. I'm just def <coughs> we're all just deflated, tired, and as two, three, four days get on, the, the deflation and tiredness went to aggravation and grumpiness and anger. Um, I saw Councilman uh, Kylie came out on uh, Saturday. I spoke with him, and a few, he spoke with a few of the other neighbors as we were pulling, uh, continue to pull debris out of the streets. Um, I believe, in my opinion, at least in our specific experience in our neighborhood, the concept of um, using um, volunteers first and then seeing what happens and supplementing it later with city um, did not work. We, uh, we had uh, a representative colleague called 211 for us, as so did one of my neighbors. And about 10 o'clock that morning, we had about 18 or 20 volunteers pop out. They were great. Thank they you, Rich. Got it. We got to get to other we speakers. Had to, That's six and a half we were, minutes. Uh, okay. We removed 11 semi-loads of debris out of our Thank neighborhood. you. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Uh, Brian Burge, one part I've seen uh, a lot of South Dakota culture rewards heroism and rewards, you know, the good things you do of those who step up to plate. We never want to lose that. The big value that is tough when it's out of cycle is to look at the value of building a culture that develops standard work documents, standard protocols that you make independent of emotion, independent of certain situation, so that when you are put under tension and pressure, you have those documents to go to that has been uh, built up in the past. So use this as an impetus to build a standard work documents and those documentation inside your, your enterprises. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Council Rich McCorris, Bramer Drive, Sioux Falls. I learned my lesson tonight to be on time for public input. <laughs> Wait till the end. But uh, tonight I just wanted to come up with one question, really, and that's the question, who is responsible? Like many of you over the last seven days, I've spent the day working, after work, get in the car, the truck, pick up, go out and pick up branches for the last six days in a row. And every night working with a different team of volunteers. And it was really interesting working. I just wanted to share my experiences to give you some perspective. What I saw over the last five to six nights, every single time when the who was responsible, the community responded, we are responsible. What I wanted to encourage the council on tonight is whatever policy is set and whatever motion is put in place is that the motion and the policy encourages personal and community responsibility. That when something like this happens, the community wakes up in the morning and says, we are responsible for this. And so I wanted to encourage you to consider that and think about as you make that policy. So for example, Friday, we spent the whole day cleaning up, chainsawing down in Hawthorne, like many of you, said to the lady, hey, we'll come back Friday night. Came back Friday night with a whole different group of volunteers. Next thing you know, every neighbor in the neighborhood came out. We erased four to six lawns just like that. So I just wanted to encourage you, that's happening all across the city. You already know that. What I wanted to encourage this evening was the following. And that's the consideration to allow the administration to continue with their current efforts that are underway. I believe that they're going really well. I work in a church and nonprofit world. What I've learned from that leadership experience is no matter what you do, we could send everybody in this check, a thousand, everybody in this city, a thousand dollar check tomorrow. You're going to hear back from 10% of the people that they're not happy. And when I do that, I always ask myself three questions. One, I want to listen to what they're saying. Two, I want to affirm what they're saying. And three, I want to ask, is there a kernel of truth that I can apply in this specific situation? But I don't necessarily want the 10% to guide the policy and everything that's happening. But I want to encourage you tonight, I've heard overwhelmingly 85 to 90% of this community is thrilled with how the administration has led. So what I would like to encourage you to do this evening is the following. Allow the administration to go for the next two to three weeks to fulfill the work they have already started and encourage the Council this evening to consider what policy and procedure do they need to put in place that's going to help the most vulnerable 10 to 30 families probably right now in our community to make sure they don't slide into homelessness as a result of this event. 
And so I want to encourage the council to be considering what do you need to do over the next couple of weeks from the reserve fund and other places to make sure the administration has the financial support to help the most vulnerable in our community. I believe the administration has done a great job with tree pickup. Let's let them finish their plan there and let the policy, the council now focus on what can we do policy-wise to make sure the most vulnerable do not get hurt by this event and set them in backward motion. I think I just want to thank you again for the service you've done over the last week. I think everybody's spirit is right in this manner, and I hope that we could come together on this and unify around a spirit of encouragement, of personal responsibility, and protecting the most vulnerable in our community. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Rich. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Dwayne Skipper, Sioux Falls. Uh, I just want to say this. Um, wherever I live or whoever knows where I live, I'm probably blacklisted because I kind of have a negative view of how government operates on a lot of things. I think that could be improved. But I will say this. I had a maple tree snap off in my yard. And I'm an independent person that says I'm going to take care of it however I can. I'll figure out a way to do it. Even at my age. So didn't bother me too much. Um, part of it did go across the sidewalk and into the boulevard area. So after seeing the pictures here, I'm thinking, well, where does that really fall in this whole thing? But uh, attempted to get something done on my own. Had a truck, a uh, small truck lined up. Uh, neighbor was going to come over and we were going to work on this 45 foot tree together. I didn't expect anybody else to do it for me. Went out there and started working. Went pretty fast. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, just as the, the other gentleman was saying, another person showed up. Well, I had a small pickup, you know, and I said, well, I don't have to help. I've got something lined up. But um, kept rolling away. And here's what I want to say about the city involvement. Uh, quite honestly, I didn't know who the third person was that came. But they had a skid loader and claw, and they were working around the corner about a block away. I was quite far away, quite honestly. And all of a sudden, the skid loader and claw comes up to my yard and starts pointing at stuff on the, on the lawn. And I said, well, I really didn't want the skid loader on my lawn, but I had a bunch of stuff uh, next to my driveway. And you, know, you want to take it, go ahead. Well, I found out it was Merle and Roy's. And I asked one of the uh, young kids, I says, well, who are you? You know, and I said, well, I work for Merle and Royce. Anyway, uh, the skid loader came back three or four times. Another person stopped by with a chainsaw, happened to know my neighbor. Anyway, I got that tree out of there in four hours. So I am thankful to the people that stepped up. I'm pretty certain at this point that Merle and Roy's was uh, contracted by the city uh, and my tree is gone. So I'm thankful that it happened. I think a lot of that happened around the city. And the, the only thing is, is that I think most people kind of take the view that, you know, what am I going to do to take care of this? Don't depend on somebody else to do it for you. I remember when we had the, the storm damage with the ice I didn't have any trees that broke off. None in my boulevard, nothing. And honestly, I said to myself, well, quite honestly, you know, uh, why should the city do all of this work? So I think the approach that the city took on this one was, you know, as probably a little discombobbled or whatever at first, but, you know, do what you can. You can call in for help etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we just, you know, I can't believe the city would have enough equipment to get that stuff off that boulevard in a timely manner anyhow. So I, I think from my viewpoint, it went very well, and, you know, a lot of that stuff's picked up already. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dwayne. Anyone else here to speak on this topic tonight? All right. Let's uh, get a motion on the floor for this. Councilor Shelley, you want to make the motion to approve it? I'm going to make an amendment. You have to approve it first. Okay, so move to approve. All right, is there a second on that? 
You know, second, all right, this fails for lack of a second then. And so that item is dead. All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. second by star. All right. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those in favor or uh, who don't want to leave say no. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>